Bishop, how are you? So, do I start this thing? I'm sorry, what? Okay, good. Ms. Brown, ready? I want to call. Okay, let's call it to order. Everybody have a seat. Thank you. Hey, we got a full house. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the City Council meeting of May 13th. Before I take the roll, I just did, I wanted to announce that Councilmember Mann was sworn into office on April 28th in a private ceremony. So with that, I'll take the roll call. Councilmember Agency Director Mann. Present. Marcus. Here. Cilio. Here. Vice Mayor, Vice Chairman Smith. Here. Mayor, Chairman Paris. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Bishop Burns. Will you lead us in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight actually for the first full meeting for the new council. And we pray, you told us in your word, that if a man want wisdom to ask you. And God, we pray for these five as they come before the people tonight with issues that are absolutely long-lasting. But we ask you to give them wisdom, give them the strength, the courage, and the tenderness to do good business that would make you pleased as you sit on your throne. Bless us tonight, and I thank you for the privilege of being present to witness you move in these five, and also those who are here in the ordinance, that we would absolutely do business that would bring about a goodness in the city of Lancaster and the contiguous areas. Bless us now and keep us. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Join me in the pledge to our nation's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You can be seated. How are we doing the presentations? Just go ahead and make the announcements. And we can go down and announce it. The first one is the mental health. Okay, are we doing that? You are. Okay. Uh, tonight we have some presentations for the uh, Mental Health Month. Is Judy Cooperberg here? Judy Cooperberg is the biggest unsung hero in this valley. No one, no one does as much as she does, and I'm really proud to be able to have you receive this award or this proclamation. And you never get any credit for it. Do you want me to go through all the whereases, or should we just get to the, you want all of them? <laughs> But there's so many of them. But it's important information. Okay. Whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, whereas mental health problems can affect all areas of a person's life, including school, home, and work, whereas mental health problems will strike one in five adults each year, regardless of age, gender, race, ethnicity, religion, or economic status, whereas nearly 30,000 American lives are lost each year to suicide and mental illness, 
Whereas all Americans, from combat veterans to hurricane victims, are vulnerable to serious mental health problems associated with trauma and can benefit greatly from early identification and treatment, whereas people can recover from mental illness and lead full productive lives in their community, whereas the cost of untreated and mistreated mental health and substance abuse problems to American businesses, governments, and families has grown to 105 billion annually. Now, therefore, be it resolved on behalf of the Lancaster City Council, I do hereby proclaim May 2008 to be Mental Health Month. National Youth Week. And who do we have for that? Jaramillo? Aramil. Aramil. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Whereas the benevolent and protective order of the Elks Lodge. 1625 has designated the week of May 4 through 10, 2008 to honor America's junior citizens for their accomplishments and to give fitting recognition for their services to their community, state, and nation, whereas the Junior Youth Olympics is dedicated to young people who represent our nation's greatest resource. Oh, you do that. Okay. <laughs> and who in years ahead will assume the responsibility for the advancement of our society, whereas our youth need guidance, inspiration and encouragement to develop the abilities of character essential for future leadership and to go forth to serve these United States of America. Whereas to, to achieve this worthy objective, we would demonstrate our partnership with youth, our understanding of their hopes and aspirations and sincere willingness to help and prepare them in every way for the responsibilities and opportunities of citizenship. Now, therefore, on behalf of Lancaster City Council, I do hereby proclaim the week of May 4th through 10, 2008, as Elks National Youth Week. Thank you. Thank you take a picture we have a whole bunch of them here in uniform hey yeah come on <laughs> come on up let's do it over here we'll get the counselor Somebody told me this week that if you put your arms around them, they can't crop you out. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. down there. Here I thought Ed took it, but it was Well, you can stay there for a little bit. Okay, thanks. You get your turn, but i got to talk for a while first. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. I'd like to take this time to tell you about some outstanding accomplishments in communications by this city in the last year. 
Last month, it was my honor to attend the California Association of Public Information Officials Conference, at which I took home for the city more awards than any other city in the state. So uh, we have reason to be proud. And I think the credit for that goes to the fact that our communications involves every department and so many people on our staff. And I'm going to show that to you as I present the awards to you today. Um, and uh, it's customary normally for awards, Mr. Mayor, for you to come down each time when we take a picture. But because there are six, what we thought we would do is we'll talk about all the awards and then we'll do all the photos together at the end. Okay? You just tell me where to go. <laughs> <laughs> You too, huh? <laughs> the, the, first, <clears throat> the first of the six awards I will be presenting tonight is a credit to Elizabeth Brubaker and her housing department staff. So Liz, please join me up here. We won a first place award in writing. Um, just one second, Nicole? Are you working the PowerPoint for me? Please? <laughs> I, I would like you to, yeah. Invite them. Liz and her staff prepared a publication called Living in Lancaster, Your Guide to Creating a Better Community. And we won a first place in writing for that publication. This piece was written to connect with residents about their own vested interest in preserving their properties and their neighborhoods. It caught people with titles like Turf battles, getting the upper hand in the war against weeds, and all cars go to heaven about donating old cars instead of leaving them in your yard. It was a good brochure, and there are copy there. Are, well, there's going to be an image on the screen in a minute for it. And I would like to ask the housing department staff to stay up here until the end, so that, like I said, we can show just how much staff is involved in communications. So, uh, for the housing department. <laughs> Sorry about this it's brief delay, but I'm going to ask Liz Bro to turn her camera over to somebody else and join me up here, please. The other first place that we took. <laughs> <laughs> the other first place award we won was for photography. Are you ready? Liz is our freelance photographer, and we hire her to shoot all of our most important events, and she has gotten wonderful images for us. In the photo that you're going to see in a minute, called Reflective Helmet, um, it was taken at one of our Aerospace Walk of Honor programs. And it shows a high school ROTC cadet who was a member of the Color Guard at that event with a very shiny helmet reflecting the whole event in the helmet. That partic particular young man has gone on to uh, be, he's preparing now to ship out to Iraq. He's in the military. And uh, so kind of the reflection is also a reflection of his future. And let's just, let's just take a moment. These are important. Sorry. Let's wait till we get it up there so everybody can see it, okay? Liz provides us with an, an imaginative eye that really captures our events in, in bite-sized pieces to show our residents. While we're waiting, Mr. Mayor, I noticed that you're using a Mac rather than an IBM. <laughs> there, there's nothing quite like a Mac. It always works. Is that a motion? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mr. Vice Mayor, after our many conversations, two points for the Mac. <laughs> this is embarrassing. This is what you call dead time. Liz, you want to say anything about the housing brochure? <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> we had a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. That is our housing brochure that we, were, we won first place for for writing. Pictures aren't bad either. And that is Reflective Helmet. That's our first place photo. The judges said that uh, there really wasn't much of a, of a closeness between us and second place. It was a really, really fabulous photo. 
And uh, if we can give a round of applause to Liz for capturing that work. I'm going to ask you to stay up here as well. And now I'm going to ask all of the Outlook uh, Committee to come join us up here. And you know who you are, although I'm going to say your name, so if you don't come, I'll catch you. In the category of community or special audience newsletter, the city won second place for the Outlook and the Outlook Light. They are produced by staff from our Parks, Recreation, and Arts Department and our admin departments and Davis Communications. So Kelly Grady from Davis Communications is going to be up here too with us. People in every department contribute, so I'd like to recognize our Outlook Committee. Angela Riley, Lori Butts, Nicole Nutt, Patricia Garibay, Lyle Norton, and Bob Green from the Parks Department. Nicole Allen, Kelly Toledano, and myself from communications. Kelly, join us, please. <coughs> I knew behind my, with eyes in the back of my head that you weren't up here yet. <coughs> uh, we've won dozens of awards for the Outlook magazine through the years, but this is the first recognition of Outlook Light, and so it's a special accomplishment for us. And uh, so for all of our staff for the Outlook magazine. <laughs> Last summer, we launched an employee newsletter for the first time, and it took second place in the state in the category of employee newsletters. Nicole? And that is Nicole's baby. Nicole was uh, created it, wrote it, helped design it with Davis Communications, and uh, did a fabulous job. And it shows because so many employees send contributions. That means that they read it, they're excited by it, and they're engaged by it, and we're really pleased by that. And I've mentioned, thank you. I've mentioned Kelly Grady a couple of times. This is Kelly. She's our designer from Davis Communications. And without her, none of these pieces could have been as good as they are and good enough to win awards. So we thank her for her contributions. Now I'd like to ask planning intern Jeannie Brown to join us up here, please. We took a second place in the category of special innovation. And I'm excited to tell you that this particular intern in our planning department came up with an idea, created it, produced it, cut out pieces of felt to make it happen. And so the Felt Board City is totally her creation. And it, it consists of this felt grid that you see on the top and hundreds and hundreds of little pieces that are cutouts of the elements of a city. She wrote scenarios and she took the project on the road from the Poppy Festival last year to classrooms and eventually to teach teachers in classrooms about civic engagement and what it means to have a role in the planning of your city from students on up. And I think that was a, a marvelous idea. She taught young people how to make a difference in their community. She talked about how planning affects the city's growth. And I think she's earned commendations from all of us for that kind of innovation. So Jean. Finally, if Shelley Henson will come up, I'd like to, you to know that we won an honorable mention award for one of our public safety programs. It's called CSI Lancaster, CSI standing for Crime Stopping Initiatives, and, uh, and that, that would go to, uh, where'd Shelley go? Did she have to? Yeah. To Shelley over there. And uh, once again, I want to thank everyone on staff who helped us get this kind of recognition. And I'm going to ask all the staff people to go that way and so that I can give you the awards and the mayor can possibly come down and take pictures with you. For the housing department. Oh, sure. For me. Which one? You gotta get out. <laughs> okay. Great job. Thank you. Oh, you get to keep it. <laughs> Liz, come here. This even makes me look good sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> one more. One more. 
See what I get it to. Okay. <laughs> Nicole, thank you. <laughs> you do do a great job. That's wonderful. Stop this. I might, there's uh, one more award. I'd like to ask Ann to stay up here for that. Um, in addition to the city's record setting achievement, our communications manager, Ann Aldridge, was honored with a very special award uh, for achievement in the field of communications while working here in Lancaster. Um, she was surprised with a lifetime achievement award, which is the highest honor that Capio can bestow. It's the Paul B. Clark Award. Uh, we take pride in the fact that Ann's 12 years of service and dedication to the city was recognized with this award. Um, it's given annually to one of the distinguished members who, members who demonstrates years and years of commitment, achievement, and I think most importantly, mentoring other people in the field. Um, we've benefited over the years from Ann's service. I always joke about Ann when she came here 12 years ago, she was given the task of being the communications manager with no budget and no staff. And the amazing part is she did it because she figured out where the money was and she took a little from here, a little from there, convinced some people to do this and some people to do that. And for a number of years she did it with very little resources. We provide a little bit more resources now. Uh, on a personal note, I have very much enjoyed working with Ann and, have, and uh, she's helped a lot in what the city has achieved over the last 12 years. I'd like to ask Ann to say a couple words and present her with the Paul B. Clark Award. Thank you, Mark, for all your kind words. This award truly was the pinnacle of my career and a tremendous honor coming as it did from 350 of my peers up and down the state. It made me very proud and very humble at the same time, but I couldn't have accomplished what I did and what I have without the tremendous support and the resources that a number of city councils throughout my time here have given to me to allow these communication strides to happen. But you know it's been said it's best to leave them wanting more. And so I think this time of great honor, I didn't get very far, did I? <laughs> Is a perfect time to tell you that I'll be leaving you. And when that happens to me, it usually helps if I take a really deep breath and just... I know this happens to you all the time. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> As 
As you know, I retired from my career with the city in December. I'm personally very invested, as you can tell, in the growth and the success of the city and in the communications, and I couldn't ha leave my office knowing the tumult it would create for me to leave at a time when we were in transition, both in our management team and in election cycle, so in our, our elected leadership. I knew it would be impossible to recruit the right person at that time to fill my shoes, and that if I just left, it would leave a hardship on a number of people and staff. So I agreed to stay on as a contractor through the election until we had stability. Well, that's where we are now. We have stability in our new council. Um, I expect that we will have great stability very, very, very soon in our management team and uh, be able to build a new, manage, a, a new city manager's team. And um, so I have confidence that if I depart now, I leave the city in good hands and that I don't cause a hardship to anyone else. So it's time. Um, it's been a pleasure to work with the elected officials and staff who've served the city as we've grown, and I'll remain committed to working in any way that I can to help make it even better. But I plan to start my next career in June. I plan to pursue some consulting opportunities, and I'm very excited about a whole string of travel plans that I'm racking up on my calendar as I go here. Um, but I want you to know I remain a loyal citizen of Lancaster, and I will be contributing to its growth as a citizen in the future. So that was my announcement. And thank you for the help getting over that hump. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have any mess here. And, and I sincerely do appreciate Ann, as you said, retired in December and agreed to stay on with us for some number of months while we got through some of the stuff we were getting through. walking back up and you've done so much with so little for so long you had to pull a piece here and a piece there and the end result of that was that all the other departments don't just look to the communications department when dealing with our community that there's that thread through it what they do every day is how is this going to look from the, to the community how can we communicate to them how can we get our message out how can we hear back from them and although it wasn't fun to do it with very little money for a long time, the end result is the organization that's, that's before you now. Thank you. And I know you were instrumental in getting me help, and I appreciate it. I just Mayor Hearns, did you have something to add? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so very much and Council for allowing me just a split second to say this, that when Ann came on, I was here. So all three of those years I've been with her, and I really appreciate that of all of the places that we've had a chance to go, uh, the Dr. Martin Luther King programs and all of that. So um, I'm not saying that when I left I took her away or nothing like that. I didn't say that. But I, I feel privileged that I had her to uh, make me look many times better than what I was looking. So I appreciate it. And Ann, our prayers go with you, and we thank God for you. Brian Ludicky. Thank you, Mayor Paris, members of the council. Uh, one of the things that you can tell about a good project is that it tends to win multiple awards. And I would like to ask Jeannie Brown, the uh, advanced planning intern, to once again step forward. The Felt Board City project, which you already saw highlighted uh, in the uh, previous awards list, has also won the top award from the Association of Environmental Professionals for the Outstanding Public Involvement in Education Program. And as you saw previously, the Felt Board City Project was actually conceived as part of our overall outreach into the community as part of the general plan update effort. And specifically, it was targeted at children, 
although we, we did do tests on uh, older people and adults, city staff, as well as children to see how it would work. Uh, one thing that we found was that children tend to design better cities than adults. <laughs> and I, I think that has to do with the fact that adults know how it should be, but kids are just looking at how it can be. Uh, anyway, Jeannie, I'd like to... Uh... present you with this award. And I, will take <laughs> but I wanted to say before, before uh, the mayor comes down and, and you get to have another picture with him, I wanted to, to really uh, point out that for Jeannie, this is actually kind of a second career. Uh, we rescued her from the Los Angeles County Library System and uh, have given her very important things to do and she has been a great help as we've gone through our general plan update effort. This is a lot more fun than the library. You just need to, to there you go. Okay, shall we get to it? City Manager, do you have any items you want to be removed? No, sir, but I'd like to take one brief moment to introduce someone. Okay. Um, from our uh, Economic Development Department, uh, Kevin Tainatango has recently transferred, and he is our new assistant to the City Manager, and I'd like to introduce Kelvin. Kelvin's worked a number of years at the city. He's done a fabulous job, and he's going to really help in the city manager's office and the whole city as well. And he will have a seat up here as soon as we can find room. Aren't you supposed to hire an assistant after we hire you? Just, just a thought. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should we go to the consent calendar? One through it. Oh. Yeah. Do I have to check that to see if we have it? She didn't put it on my list. Do we read the public business from the floor? We have no public business from the floor on the consent calendar items. See, she put it in red, everything I'm supposed to say. And it's, it's not there. <laughs> okay, council, any items from the agency consent calendar we should pull? Nothing? Good. I move we adopt the consent calendar. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? I guess we should just vote. Yes. Approved unanimously. Any items on the council consent calendar that we should pull for discussion? Mr. Mayor, I'd like to request uh, CC2 to be pulled as I was not present for April 22nd's meeting. Okay. Anything else? Okay. With the exception of CC2, do we have a motion? Uh, I'll move that we uh, adopt the, um, the consent calendar as now constituted. Is there a second? I second that motion. Okay. Vote. It's unanimous. I move that we adopt uh, consent calendar item number two. Second. Let's vote. It's unanimous with uh, Mr. Mann abstaining. Okay, so now we have the public hearing for the Lancaster sewer, sewer system, and that would be a report from Director Randy Williams. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. This evening before you, we have a, uh, an item concerning the Lancaster Sewer Maintenance System. This is a process that the Council directed staff to undertake beginning with a Council meeting on the 12th of December in 2006. At that meeting, the Council um, 
directed that the city should begin necessary steps to accomplish the transfer of the sewer maintenance function from the former county consolidated sewer maintenance district to become locally controlled by the city of Lancaster. At that time, and since the city's incorporation, the city has been the owner of that sewer system, but the county sewer maintenance district was maintaining that sewer system for us. There were some changes that took place in state law about the responsibilities and liabilities that led to a duplication that the council felt was inappropriate, and so that was the reason then for us to undertake this endeavor. Another emerging reason was that the city, excuse me, the county during the course of time had not been collecting any fees that would allow for the replacement of the sewer should a sewer collapse or failure occur. Under such conditions, the city would have been responsible most likely from its general fund to pay for any of those types of repairs. So as part of the organization of a new sewer system within the city of Lancaster, it was agreed that there should be a certain amount of money set aside for the ultimate replacement of the aging system within the city. We, the council last May, then adopted the first engineer's report that described how the city would assume full responsibility beginning the 1st of July 2008 and authorizing the establishment of a fee in the amount of $9 per servicing unit that would accomplish or would accrue the amount of money necessary for city staff to undertake the rest of the transfer agreement and to begin to establish the separate fund specifically for sewer maintenance functions. As part of that recommendation in May, which was adopted by the council, there was a proposal, or we identified for you the fee for the first year, as I said, was $9 per servicing unit. For the second year, fiscal year 0809, would be a total amount of $62. And then for 09010, it would go up to $78. So those were set as maximums, and staff had set for itself the goal of trying to stay within that maximum. And if we were to exceed it, we'd have to come back to the council, and there would be separate public hearings held to give the community an opportunity to file a majority protest. We are not proposing that we exceed the amounts previously adopted and previously considered by the community under that process. So what we are proposing this evening, that the council go ahead with our previously recommended and now reaffirmed sewer maintenance fee per single family residential equivalent in the amount of $62. I should have explained earlier that last year, so beginning with the 1st of July 2008, excuse me, 2007, when the council adopted a $9 fee, that was in addition to the then in existence fee of $35.50 per same equivalent unit being collected by the county. So now that amount previously collected by the county rolls over to the city, and so the $62 is not an increase from $9 to $62, but rather from $44.50 to $62. One other important piece of information I wanted to share with the council this evening was, as we have worked to get to this point and presenting to you the engineer's report this evening, we have identified that there are some 3,850 single family residential equivalents that were annexed into the sewer district, that were serviced by the sewer district, but were never added to the tax rolls by the county when it was under county operation administration. So we will be, as part of our undertaking for the next couple of months, notifying each of those property owners that their property will be rightfully and appropriately added to the tax roll for the fiscal year beginning 0809. We will not be seeking any any payment of past due amounts, but rather just accept that as being past history and off it goes. But these are properties that have been serviced and therefore are rightfully appropriate to be paying these amounts. The city staff then therefore recommends the adoption of resolution 08-35, which will put into place for fiscal year 0809 the $62 fee as proposed. If the council has questions, I'd certainly be happy to try to address those for you. Any questions? 
No, we have no speaker's cards also, Mr. Mayor. City Clerk. No communications and no speaker cards. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, any discussion? Any motion? I'll move we adopt uh, resolution number 0835. Second that. Let's vote. It's unanimous. Let's open the public hearing for, what is it, PH2? Uh, we'll hear the staff report from the planning director, Brian Ludicky. Thank you, Mayor Paris and members of the council. The item that's before you on this public hearing is the appeal of a staff decision to deny an electronic center message sign uh, at the Lancaster Marketplace Commercial Center. Several months back, the roof sign that is located on this center was damaged by wind. The city uh, code enforcement division, in acting towards that, contacted the owner of the center and asked them to please repair this particular sign. The owner of the center came forward with a proposal that included not only the repair of that sign, but the inclusion in it of a of an electronic uh, message component. The marketplace is located within the city's regional commercial zone. Within that zone, electronic message signs are prohibited uh, with a couple of exceptions. One is if they are only used for public service messages or time and temperature. The other is if they are part of a mall identification sign as the term is used within the code. In our review of the code language in the regional commercial zone, uh, the term mall is intended and normally defined as containing several anchor department stores or other major tenants uh, along with other individual retail users. It's clear from our reading of the code as well as the overall zoning code itself that the use of electronic message signs is intentionally restricted. Within our code, the only other location that is permitted to have one of these types of signs is the city's auto mall, which clearly functions as a regional draw. In the drafting of the regional commercial zone some 15 years ago, it was clear that the intent was to allow an electronic message sign where you had a commercial center of sufficient size to act as a regional draw. In this particular case, uh, we do not feel as a staff that this center meets that test. First, in looking at the overall square footage of the center, which occupies approximately 20 acres and contains about 230 to 240,000 square feet of floor area, the, uh, the Urban Land Institute, which is a developer uh, organization of, uh, that, that really defines how some of these different types of uses are categorized indicates that a regional commercial center normally consists of some 400,000 square feet or greater, normally contains at least one uh, full line department store, uh, and normally will occupy a site that is anywhere from 80 to 200 acres in size. It's really from our standpoint clear that the possible aesthetic effects of a, of a message board, an electronic sign, with its capability for flashing and changing of messages uh, is an aesthetic consideration and is balanced against what the draw of that center is that's allowed to have it. And in our view, in terms of trying to balance this particular, particular situation, we don't feel that the, the regional draw component of the Lancaster marketplace is really sufficient or in place to justify the use of an electronic message sign as, as permitted by the code uh, in a mall situation. Based on that, we did deny the request. The applicant appealed that. Uh, we did have one meeting internally with them uh, that included the city's economic development uh, staff and attempted to see if there was some resolution that we could reach on this matter. Uh, that meeting was not successful in terms of resolving this issue. 
We continue to believe as a staff that the restrictions on the electronic message signs were put in place in the code for a reason and that certainly the allowance of them it has to be carefully weighed. And as an example, I would tell you that if you look at the, the draw potential and what happens at the Lancaster marketplace, uh, where the potential for an electronic message sign uh, could be allowed in that zone, and then you look exactly across the street at Valley Central, which contains approximately 750,000 square feet of floor area, they are not permitted any kind of a, an electronic message sign under the code. We think that there is a real concern that could be raised here in regards to equity. Uh, certainly there's an aesthetic concern that we feel exists uh, if we do not um, carefully weigh what ought to be considered a regional draw and what should not be considered one. The question of whether a center such as Lancaster Marketplace ought to be permitted an electronic sign we feel is a different question. If the council feels that that's something that ought to be investigated, then that's really something that staff should go back and evaluate on a citywide basis. But in this particular instance, we do not feel that the Lancaster Marketplace meets the test of a regional mall, uh, and we have recommended that you uphold the denial of the sign and deny the appeal that was filed. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I have a few. You, you probably know that I'm a believer in billboards. <laughs> I had not noticed. <laughs> but what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm hearing that we're, we're now in a situation where a business owner, uh, and it's a substantial business owner, uh, comes in, looks at the code, and is being rejected because staff has a feeling because the code doesn't really specify. I mean, it, it, it's poorly defined. Uh, if I was that business owner, I would be uh, really upset because, you know, it, it's so ambiguous. It's, if you decided you did want to give them the sign, you could have done so. Uh, I don't think that's the, the purpose of our ordinances. I, I think ordinances should be clear and specific and allow people to plan. Uh, on another level, is there some talk of putting a, a uh, an electronic sign in that area to service all the businesses? I would I would defer that to to the economic development director, who has had conversations with another uh, business owner and property owner in the area. Yeah, I think I can answer that if I might, Mayor. Uh, there's another uh, center that's proposed near there, near the hotels that have just been constructed where we are talking about a uh, uh, electronic sign for a regional facility. And would that incorporate both facilities, both areas? The potential would be there to incorporate both advertisement on that sign for both facilities. That would obviously be negotiation between the city and the two center owners. The, you know, the concern I have is, is ultimately the city's a business and that, that business is supported by sales tax. And if these businesses have a drop in, in revenue because they can't get their message out, it, it affects all of us. And I also understand there's a problem of, of the aesthetics of, of signage. But I think it's something we need to address certainly more aggressively than we have. Uh, and I'd kind of like to see his pictures eventually of, of the sign he wants to use. And in addition to that, he's got a really ugly sign there now. It's all blown apart that we need to get fixed. What, what does he do if we don't give him the electronic sign? He has the ability to reface the sign that he has. The, the sign that he has is a really big sign. Yes, it is. How, is. how is that any less attractive than what he wants to do? Well, without getting into the issue of the aesthetics, I... I you know, that's a, that's a debatable point. I can only tell you that that sign is a permitted sign. The code does allow someone to reface a permitted sign. And, and I, don't, I don't mean to be critical of you, Brian. I, I know, you know you're doing what you, you need to do. But it sounds to me like what we're talking about is we're telling him to put up a really big, ugly sign instead of having an electronic, pretty sign. And I, I, I mean, isn't that what's happening here? Uh, I mean, the sign there is really big and it's really ugly. You know, shouldn't shouldn't we shouldn't we use common sense and figure out a way to 
to make this work? I think, uh, I think from my perspective, if you were going to look at electronic signs, however, I think there is an equity issue for the city as a whole. And perhaps the appropriate path would be to look at whether they ought to be allowed, and if so, what sizing should be allowed. Because at this point, um, th there's really nothing to guide in terms of if there were another center owner who were to look at that and say, aren't I entitled to the same thing? For what I for what I accomplished. Well, would they? Would they be? I think I think you would get at least one other request, Jess. If I may speak, <clears throat> typically, Brian, isn't it my understanding, and you correct me, uh, being a planning commissioner for close to 16 years, isn't there a a size of the sign, both in height and square footage, that's typically proportionate to the square footage of floor space within? certain codes of the the city's ordinance yes the city does does contain standards within its code as far as how large and how big right <clears throat> so uh, in concurring with the mayor I mean obviously I'm my his, history has been to try to support business you know I think that maybe what might be done would be either to try to see if we can't forge a I, I'm a <clears throat> when I when I visited this with uh, Mr. Bozegan, I was a little bit concerned about the marketplace owner being at a disadvantage when we're dealing with another individual, and a little bit uncomfortable if, if in all due fairness, if we're going to put up another board that we do allow electronic messaging, is whether or not there's a fair share of use of an additional sign, and if we're going to ask somebody else to put it up, um, I have some concerns there. Isn't this something we should put off for a little bit and sit down and work out some kind of compromise that is going to benefit the city and the business owner? That's an option that the council has if they would direct staff to work out some compromise with the with the owner. What do you think? Do well, well I, I think whenever we make a decision like that, you go into cities that have proper signage codes. There's different qualities. We've all driven through cities that look like it's uh, it's a, there's a yard sale on every corner and an ugly sign and, and it has a bad look to it. And so I think we have to really be judicious on allowing certain things like this. As Mr. Ludicky said, you know, this is just one step. We have the code there. Then how many other people, you know, the equity that's going to come up and before you know it, we're, we're going to have all these flashing signs all over the place. I, I myself don't, uh, don't think that that actually adds to the quality of the design of the city and we're looking towards better code designs. Um, I myself wouldn't be in favor of, um, of granting them the appeal right off. Uh, I think maybe we can look at it in the future, but uh, I'm just not one that's going to, I think we have to, actually when you go to quality cities, they actually pull back the signage a little bit rather than having it all flashy and gaudy, and that, that would be my own aesthetic opinion. I, I don't think there's any question communities are prettier without signs. They just are. I also don't think there's any question that businesses suffer dramatically when those signs are taken down. And, and it seems to me that we need to be balancing this a little better than we are, especially in light of the fact that he gets to keep this really big sign. We can't make him take that down, right? No. Uh, and what I would propose is that we try to figure out something that works for everybody rather than something that doesn't work for him and doesn't work for us because we still end up with a, with a I mean, what we end up with is a, an eyesore instead of something else. And it just seems that we could uh, work on this a little better and or a little harder to, to come up with something that works. And as far as the types of businesses and the amount of business at the market center, aren't we putting the cart before the horse? I mean, maybe the reason they're not there is because there's not enough signage to bring the customers to, to shop there. I mean, I don't know. The, the function of marketing is to bring customers in. And, you know, like I said, I, I, I would not be here but for billboards. I mean, they are an incredibly effective uh, method. Well, it's true. I wouldn't. That's, we all know that. All right. I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, just for a little clarification, uh, thinking along the lines of, of, of a compromise or an alternative solution, do we, did I hear you right that we do or don't have anything in the code regarding the size of electronics signs to the square footage? We just don't have enough of them to have that 
kind of regulation on hand yet? No, there is nothing, actually there's nothing that defines as far as an electronic identification sign what size or, or height or anything else is. And just as an example, I believe that the auto mall sign was, was run through the Planning Commission who made a recommendation to the Council who ultimately approved that final design. Well, let's hear what the folks have to say, you think? Yes. Well, I have one more question, Mr. Mayor. One of the questions I would have on the marketplace, we're talking about being, uh, bringing in more business and retail. Um, a couple times when I've gone in there in the past, it's gone from retail to almost a quasi-business park where there was, I think there was a doctor in there at one time, there's a gym, there's, you know, so should we consider the amount that of business that isn't retail sales tax generating compared to retail is another park that's maybe just solely a business park get to put up an electronic sign too I think that's something that needs to be considered. I don't know are there any lawyers in there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they have any billboards up. Do we have, do we have speaker cards? Uh, yes we do. Yeah, let's hear what the, yeah, see what the folks have to say. Uh, Mr. Navarajo? Yeah, do we not let the, the applicant go first? One of these, the, is that the applicant? Oh, here it is. Okay. I think that's the applicant. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry, how do you pronounce your name? Good evening, I'm Farmers Yusef Sadeh, F-A-R-A-M-A-R-Z, Yusef Sadeh is Y-O-U-S-E-F-Z-A-D-E-H. I'm one of the owners of Lancaster Marketplace. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Sitting there and listening to you, Mr. Mayor, I, you sort of took away most of the things I wanted to say, so I'll keep it very short. First, I want to thanks, thank you all for the opportunity to speak, and I also want to thank a lot of people who are here wearing our Support the Sign stickers. These are customers, tenants, uh, friends of the Lancaster Marketplace who all want to see that sign to be built. Uh, just so that I can be clear, uh, we didn't wait to, for building and safety to come to us and say put up a sign. We immediately went and we took all the steps necessary to make an application to put our sign up. I have with me a poster board that has a picture of the proposed sign and I'll be happy to bring it forth so you can see it. I think it's large enough and I'll show it to the audience as well. But a big majority of that big sign right now is not going to be a, uh, a programmable sign majority of it is going to be a fixed sign. It's going to be smaller and it's going to withstand the winds that we have in Lancaster, so it's not going to blow off. And this is the most, uh, the most recent version of Dactronic sign. And I have the representative of Dactronic. Can, can you show here. the folks so they see what we have here too? Absolutely. This, uh, this is going to put a, a brand new face on that sign and it's going to be much more pleasing and much more aesthetic than what we have now. I, I just want to, rather than go through all the points that I had, I want to make a, a few quick comments, if I may. Uh, first of all, our property is uh, not 20 acres, it's 24 acres. It is not 200,000 square feet, it's 270,000 square feet. We have, to, we have the room and the parking to build another 50,000 square feet, and we have talked to several other tenants, and in fact, next week we will be at the ICSC trying to get anchors. So we, we are one of the largest centers in the city of Lancaster. And we fit the definition of a regional mall as it's defined in the RC zoning. The, most of the reliance that the staff has placed in defining a mall is from the shopping center book by the ULI. The staff has used the second edition, which was really came out in the 90s. This is the third edition. And I won't bore you, but if you go to page eight where shopping center, regional malls, and whatnot are defined, you will see that we fit within the definition. First of all, they talk about in, on page 8 where most of the staff got their definitions from, they talk about a, a, a regional mall, uh, the staff has used a 450,000 square feet. That is not accurate. In that table they show that a typical range is 300,000 square feet and above with a population of 150,000 or more. Here in the city of Lancaster we're not at 150,000 yet so it would be uh, completely logical that would be on the smaller end of that scale. So as far as footage and size, we are within that definitional mall according to ULI. 
more importantly, we have the anchor draws with the national tenants that we have in our center, including Reebok, including Levi's. Harbor Freight is a major draw to our center. You mentioned uh, the other side. We met with the economic development and also building and safety, and we told them that we would be more than happy to share this sign with all the surrounding retailers, including Cinemark and including all the other zoning. Uh, one last point that I oh, want wait a minute. to... Uh, on, on appeals, I, I think they get, a, they get a right to present their appeal, okay? Uh, and, and so I don't want to use the... I, I will only take a few more minutes. No, 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 you're okay. okay. I mean, it, no, we're going to... We'll be as long as we need to. You're, you have a right to appeal the decision, and let's, let's hear, hear you out, okay? What Mr. I was Mr. mentioning Mayor, is that... Mr. Mr. Mayor? Just for clarification, in the past, we have applied the, the three-minute rule to every speaker, even the appellants. Uh, there's no, no reason why you can't change that. Let's it, change that, okay. That's, that's fine. It, I just want to make sure that we're clear and that you're actually making a conscious decision to change. Well, I think people should be, if you're appealing a decision, I don't know how you can, you can competently do that in three minutes. And so, that's yeah, fine. I think we should change that. Thank you, Mr. Historically, on the Planning Commission, applicants tended to get more time because they had to explain what the project's about and what they're after. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned that we had offered, not just through the economic development, we actually have called the, the owners and the retailers near Lancaster Marketplace, including Cinemark, including Devel Developers Diversified, which we know very well and have a relationship, and we have offered them a space on the, on the board for advertising. So that will happen with, without a question. Excuse In me, fact, but, yes, but that, that leads me to believe that perhaps you're going to use this as a revenue generating device. You, you, this could not become a profit center. To operate it and to maintain it with the amount of energy that it takes and, and what we have to do, the intent is really to benefit the tenants and to increase their sales and increase their visibility. Okay. This isn't intended to become a profit center for Lancaster Marketplace. Uh, and the upfront cost, we are lucky if we recoup that upfront cost over five years. Um, we have also contacted Hopkins, which tentatively is planning to develop across from us. And we have had conversations with them. And just incidentally, I had a conversation with them today. And J.C. Penney, who is supposed to be their anchor, is off the table. So the viability of that project is now in question. And whether an another sign will go on or whether we can share another sign with them is highly in doubt, at least for the next few years because of the economic downturn. Um, we will also use this sign for public safety. We will use it for amber alerts. We will use it for construction notices on the highway and so on. So it will serve a public function as well. Um, as far as the equity issue that uh, was mentioned, I will tell you that we have an existing center with existing tenants that need this sign and need this visibility today. And the equity dictates that we have it today. We, it, it is. It is a fact that a developer is deciding to come and make a substantial outlay to put this sign up for the benefit of the tenants. That in and of itself should be a wonderful news to the economic development that somebody is investing more. And it is true, just to address, that we do have some service providers in our center, but the bulk majority of our tenants are sales tax paying retail tenants. I will answer any questions if you have. And the sign is available if you care to see it. What if we, if it takes five years to pay for the sign, what if we did a five-year approval and that it would have to come down at the end of five years? And the, and the reason for that is, is I think ultimately we do need a regional sign for that area uh, and perhaps one that's actually operated by the city. I, I, I mean, I don't know why this has to be. I mean, I, I think it's a, a genuine concern that we don't want signs all over the place. But I also think it's a genuine concern of businesses that they have to alert the people on the freeway that they exist. Um, Mr. Ludicky, you have Ms. any thoughts? Mr. Mayor, if I may address that real quick. Uh, this argument that if you approve this sign, you will see signs all over SR 14 is not a legitimate argument. And the reason is, one, according to the zoning laws that are in place, the only place that can have, other than the automobile, that can have 
a programmable sign is the RC zone, which is a power center, Lancaster marketplace, and up to the exit sign. There isn't anywhere else that can, within the current zoning law, get this kind of sign. And within that, that area, there are only a few spots that could conceivably have a sign, and there are only a f conceivably fewer number of people who would make the outlay to put up such a sign. So it seems to me that it's extremely remote that we would have another one, more than one, if we do it. And that's assuming Hopkins goes through and Hopkins decides to put up a sign. Okay, well, let's assume Hopkins doesn't. But we do have the Power Center, and we do have Cinemark, all of which could benefit from that sign. Isn't this something that, that the three of you, the three centers, should be working with city staff on to, to do something that, that meets all of those needs? Agreed. Agreed. Okay. And we went to the city for that. The option that was... Yeah, but now you got the mayor on your side. Well, yeah. <laughs> and... and, and and if that is your decision, and if that w is what you want us to do, we will be happy to sit with the city and work it out. And as I said, well, you we are in existence. You've got, you got to sell the other four. Okay. <laughs> we, we are an existing center. We will put up the sign if we get the green light. Hopkins has been out there doing nothing. Uh, that's just dirt. And we don't know when it's going to happen. We will put up the sign. We will provide space to all the retailers. We will comply with all the requirements, size requirements. We believe that it is within the size requirements, but if it isn't, we will comply. When we went to the city to sit and negotiate, negotiation was very simple. You, don't, you can't put a sign. And in fact, our other alternative was, why don't you take the existing sign off? And, and I mean, what kind, that's not a negotiation. But we are more than happy to, to uh, work with the city and provide the city a sign that is aesthetically pleasing, works for the community, and works with the businesses and the retailers. Any questions? I had a question. Forgive my voice, I've been sick for a while. My son-in-law says I sound like Wolfman Jack. Um, one question that I had was, according to the verbiage that's going to go on the electronic part of the sign, Who's gonna Who's gonna uh, oversee that? Lancaster Marketplace will oversee that. No single tenant will. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we will have control over it. Would the city play a part in that at all? I mean, if it's going to be used for public as well as for the Lancaster Marketplace. Mr. Wasserman from Dactronics is here, and he can explain more. But basically, we will have a center where everything can come in and. People call in and say, this is what needs to go on, and so on. So they can take in public announcements or urgent emergency messages that can go on that, uh, uh, on that center. You know, I, I passed the, uh, the Lancaster Automall sign, and City of Lancaster has its logo up there for two or three seconds and other announcements. And that certainly can happen here as well. I just, you know, I think about the, you know, the thrift store look, and I think about... Um, misspellings and different things that you know can happen and is there going to be someone who's going to be I mean really oversight yeah. of that and make sure that it's very appealing and it looks is, nice yes, and it generally goes to a central station that does it automatically off-site and goes through a program that okay. uh, checks everything okay, okay. thank you I, I will be available for any further questions if you okay. is it Gus and no no Okay. I'm sorry, what? Oh, your pass? Okay, good. Uh, Ed Wasima? Wasserman. Wasserman? You need handwriting lessons. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My parents wanted me to be a doctor, and I should have. Um, good evening, and thank you all for your time. I apologize. I'm going to look down here with new glasses, and I've only got, I guess, three minutes, so I'll try to do this as quickly as possible. I appreciate your... Um, ability and allowing us to have the opportunity tonight. Um, this has been weeks, months of planning and researching, and I really appreciate the opportunity to present to you tonight. So thank you. Um, I am with Dactronics. Dactronics is the manufacturer of LED displays. That's all we do. Um, basically, every sign that you have here electronically in the city of Lancaster is a Dactronic sign. So if you have any questions about programming and networking, if you don't mind, I'm going to save that for the questions so that I can get to the, to the letters of the law. But I would love to answer that, and the answer is yes, we can. Okay? Um, if I can, I'll do this ever so quickly. 
Mr. Ludeke is doing his job, and he does a great job at what he does. It is no insult to him with what I'm discussing here. In your section codes, it clearly states that or other major tenants with individual retail services and dining uses arranged between them. That is clearly the definition of a mall, okay? Not and or, or. I'm reading the letter of the law. The letter of your codes simps clearly states that the Lancaster market is a mall. It goes on to say, and I do believe that we have a definition about anchor, and anchor is clearly in his book that we discussed, the shopping handbook, a anchor is clearly what a owner decides to put between two ends of their, of their ownership. If, if the owner decides to put a Jeffy loop there or he decides to put a doctor's office, that's an anchor. It doesn't mean that it has to be a Neiman Marcus. It doesn't have to be a Saks Fifth Avenue. Also, national chains we discussed already, Claire's Barn, Pro Sports Outlet, Reebok, Nike, all of these should be considered major tenants. It, your, zone, your zoning ordinance goes on. The peripheral freestanding uses may include but are not limited, limited to discount and warehouse style large volume retailers. The memorandum dated 11-4, um, oops, sorry, missed a point here. Um, additionally, back in 1994, the ex notes and letters from previous mayors, previous city development directors, and I have copies all for you, just going through the book, it clearly states in their writing, congratulations on your mall. In your zoning ordinance, it clearly states that this is a mall. It calls it a shopping center, and I have all those backdated for you. So what has occurred from 1994 to 2008? Nothing except for everything is still status quo. And I have all those for you if I can pass those out for you today. Um, additionally, Mr. Ludeke states in the denial letter the RC zone was intended to be unique in his final paragraph, he goes on and he states, um, he, it is true that the Lancaster marketplace contains some very viable and in certain instances unique tenants. However, it has not been demonstrated that the center contains the size, type, or mix, again going back to the handbook, which again is not in your codes, so we're using a book that quite frankly is not part of the actual law. What he's saying is not correct. What If you want to use that definition of the, of the code, we are an average commercial mall, exactly as he said. We are over 286,000 square feet. The average is 300,000. The average is based on a population of 150,000 or greater. Lancaster is just a tiny bit smaller. Um, up, it further goes on to state, if I can, from the final thing, and this will be my final paragraph. This is also from the Shopping Center Handbook. As a result, of, and, then, and I quote, as a result of bankruptcies and consolidations in the department stores industries during the late 80s and 90s, a shortage of suitable department stores or anchors occurred. Consequently, non-traditional anchors that earlier would have been considered inappropriate or unworkable are becoming commonplace in regional and super-regional centers. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Amy Ellington. Hi. Hi. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I just happened to go on the website this morning, and um, I was looking to see when your meetings were going to be, and I came across it. And um, I just wanted to see if, um, when you guys campaigned, I thought it was, you're going to be changing, you're going to be helping businesses. And I thought this was the prime opportunity for me to be able to come and see if you guys are doing supporting the business. So I went through, I called the zoning, I called the office, I called the planning commission, and when I talked to the um, zoning, he said that the land that the businesses are on are zoned for certain areas. If this is zoned for a regional, um, it's the RC zone, and they, when they put them and they get their business license, they're approved for that zone. And so I was just wondering what all the controversy is about if they're in the zone and they have all the things that regulate the zone. And it says that they can have the mall identification sign. And then, then they said, well, the big controversy is, is if it's the mall or not. So um, I just was wanting to support them because I think that all the definitions and the different things that they're talking about, it boils down to do you support the business or not. 
You guys, they zoned it. They allowed him to go there. They let him set up this business to draw. They also say in the thing that they um, have the ability to draw, to be a regional mall. The wording is, do they have the ability? I think they do have the ability, and they have a lot of potential, and we need to get behind them and get marketing and get doors in there so this town can grow. And you guys put all of your um, committee, you put your planning commission, you spread it out, you got new people on there. I hope you work with them. And I don't know if they need any help. I mean, they may have all kinds of proposals, but I think we need to work together with them. And if the Jet Hawk don't have somebody from L.A., I don't think you're going to shut them down if because they're not drawing certain ones. I mean, I don't think you're going through checking that. You've got a business here, and I did write you out all this letter, and I don't think I'm going to have all that time to go through line by line. But I think the bottom line is, let me read the bottom part. Um, that's more just my stuff. I said this land is zoned as RC. The city approved the Lancaster Marketplace to go on this land. They are governed by the code. If the Lancaster Marketplace did not meet the requirements, or if the requirements have changed, then you need to change the code or the zoning. Right now, Lancaster just received the reward, I hope this is true, of the business friendliest city in California. The most business friendly city in California. That's really an honor. I mean, I did you guys get that award? Did we get that award? And so, wow. So, you know, I want you yeah, I want you guys to prove it. Yeah. So this is one of our commercial centers and it has the greatest potential for regional growth. And they're being denied that time with the electronic message board. Thank you. So that's what I think it boils down to. How will you work with Thank them? You. To become a friendly, possible See, that, that thing that's beeping, that means you have Yeah, it means I'm done. <laughs> so it's going to take 15 seconds. I don't mean it means I'm over. Okay. But um, thank you, and I hope you did read them. Thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Okay, let's close the public hearing. Uh, is there a motion? I, I, a little discussion, I think, first. Okay. Um, when I look at the ordinance, says I'm not convinced they meet the requirements as as the regional draw that we typically have for for illuminated sign for the uh, the message board signs. However, some things I've heard tonight, uh, there's some intriguing possible compromises or solutions here, and that is that the rather than looking at an individual shopping center, a single message board for uh, Prince Valley Central Way, because when you look at it in toto, there could be a need for a, a message board. Problem is we don't have the ordinances and regulations in place to do that right now. So uh, at first glance, the answer to me is, is to deny this, but the, the proper solution is, is more than just deny this. It's work with all of the businesses along Valley Central Way, have staff put together some recommendations for what will be our new planning commission to look at uh, in terms of what makes sense uh, size-wise, um, what percentage of the message board should be typically some percentage that has gone to, for public uses. Uh, all these things need to be looked at, and I don't think we can we can achieve that solution sitting here tonight. I think this is going to have to come back to us in some form with a potential solution if we want to go the route of an electronic message board. I think all those things would have to be addressed. And Mr. Mayor, I, I agree with Councilman Cilio. I think that on its on its face, I don't think that the applicant has met its burden of proof that they that uh, they're in compliance with the with the ordinance. I think maybe the ordinance needs a compromise, and we need to change it. And uh, so, I don't think that we should. Um, I think that we should uphold and deny the appeal at this time, but maybe direct staff to go back and, and look at those compromises that you suggested. The, the, the problem I would have with uh, upholding the the appeal is these things tend to get lost, uh, meaning time wise. I mean, this is something these guys need to resolve. And what I would prefer to do is just continue this and direct staff to meet with all of the entities involved and let's put a timeline on it uh, and how does that sound to you well, Mr. Mayor, we have uh, been waiting for this sign for close to a year now but i don't have the votes the problem of waiting one more month is not going to but, but we would like to get the sign fixed we 
you would like it, you would like it to not look the way it is. You would like to put something in place. Oh, will you fix the clock tower too? Sorry? Will you fix the clock tower too? It looks terrible. Okay, good. Excuse me. Could you come to the podium, please? Thank you. I apologize. Um, I, if, if you believe that we could find a better compromise by sitting down and working this out, we'll be, we'll be more than happy to do that. And if you want to set a short timeline for us to get together and go through that, we will be happy to comply. I, th I think a realistic timeline to, to actually accomplish something that's going to work would probably be 90 days, not 30. Uh, I will say this. I don't believe an approval needs a council vote. If we are going back, this thing, this thing within the zoning can be approved by uh, Mr. Ludicky in his uh, department. Because this is not a conditional use permit, this is not a variance. I would be uncomfortable with that. Okay. Be before we put a, a I mean, it's, this is going to be a rather large sign on the freeway. I, I want everybody, including the public, to get a chance to look at it and voice their opinions on it. But what I'd like to do is just continue this matter for 90 days with a direction to staff to work with you, uh, the, the uh, Power Center, and Cinemark to come up with a uh, with an alternative vehicle uh, that uh, would address everyone's concerns. May I make a suggestion? Sure. The power center's developer, the ownership of the power center, and Cinemark, and my office, and the city of Lancaster will all be in Las Vegas next week for the International Council of Shopping Centers. Brian. That is the opportunity for us to do that. <laughs> it will not take 90 days. It will take one week from now for that meeting to occur. I think that's a great idea. Could, can you accommodate them? Yes, Brian. Um, so but it's still, it's still going to be 90 days to put it all together. Right. We, we, can certainly, we can certainly work to accommodate that meeting in Las Vegas. However, I think the 90 days is a reasonable time period to put it together. We don't know that we're going to come to an agreement if we meet. No, I, I know. And, and I, I agree with that, and I think that if staff happens to come up with it in 60 days, then they'll bring it forward to us. Okay. But I think the 90 day, so I'll second the mayor's motion. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, to accommodate what Councilmember Smith just said, it seemed to me the, the way to do it would be to continue it to a date not to exceed 90 days. Um, but it could be an earlier date if council or if staff is able to work up the, uh, the solution and we'll be back on the, uh, the agenda at that point. So move. And that was your motion. So I'll second that one. <laughs> Before we call for the vote, can I get a clarification just so that there's an understanding in relationship to the cooperative parties with the sign? Not that I'm against it because I think it really stated that. I just, my concern is, is, um, given that we're, it's my interpretation to support what uh, Councilman Cilio said earlier and Councilman Smith, I don't think our current code supports that. I'm not opposed to doing a workout agreement, you know, and having one sign for the collective total, but I am a little bit concerned about the control of the sign. I want to make sure that if we're just going to continue it to do a workout deal, then if that's the understanding, then I'm fine with the motion. No, I think the whole thing has to be revamped. I think we need to look at the ordinances, and certainly there's going to be control issues uh, of the sign that, have, that city staff has to take care of with the entities involved. But it's a global... Uh, I, I would like staff to look at the whole issue globally, uh, and let's get those ordinances uh, clearly defined. Uh, because from what I heard, I think they're correct in the definitions that, that were provided. And if that's not what the city wants to do, let's fix that. Yes. Uh, I think during that period of time, too, staff could always come back within 30 days with a, uh, a progress report in case they need more direction and specificity from the council, too. Yes. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> my concern is I just don't want to set a precedent here moving forward, given that we're, you know, currently I believe the, there's only, in our code, only both the, uh, regional commercial, because I was one of the city and planning commissioners that voted on that project initially and took that area in under regional commercial, and I'm clear that when we put together the sign ordinance to support it, I know what our intent was. Right now, my interpretation is, is not that that was what the intent. Now, if there's 
other developments is going to take place within that area, then maybe that could be the regional draw sign that's used. I just want to make sure that if that's the case, originally it wasn't outlined to be that way. Now we're starting to modify, and I just want to make sure there's, there's clarity so that we're not putting ourselves out there in the future in relationship to making other modifications. Because I know that I, sitting as a planning commissioner two, three months ago, we just had the, uh, <clears throat> the adjacent shopping center come before us, and there was some discussion about signage, and we voted on it. And I would want somebody to come and say, oh, it's based on our interpretation of the code as well. Now we need a reader board, and then now it proliferates. Yeah, that's what we're hoping to, to uh, prevent. Okay. okay. Okay, ready to vote? Passes unanimously. Okay. Let's open the public hearing on PH3, and we'll hear from Elizabeth Hoover. Good evening, Mayor Rex Paris and City Council members. Before you tonight is the recommendation to approve the proposed projects for the city's community development block grant funds referred to as CDBG 2008 one-year action plan application. In order to proceed with the city's one-year action plan application, which serves as the formal document to HUD for CDBG funding, it is necessary for the city council to take public testimony on the projects. The one-year action plan is intended to provide a summary of program activities, eligib eligibility criteria, and funding levels for the 2008 CDBG program year. All programs and or projects submitted in the subject plan are in compliance with HUD guidelines. All proposed and funded projects utilizing CDBG funds must meet nation, national objectives and eligibility activities pursuant to the Code of Federal Regulations. The City is responsible for assuring that each eligible activity either benefits a low and moderate income person, aids in the prevention or elimination of slums or blight, or meets a need having a particular urgency. Eligible activities are those related to real property, economic development, public service, assistance to community-based development organizations, planning, and administrative activities. The City of Lancaster has been a CDBG entitlement community since 1986 and receives an annual grant for developing viable urban communities that encompasses decent housing, suitable living environments, and expanded economic activities, primarily for low and moderate income persons. A CDBG entitlement community, such as Lancaster, receives a federal block grant every year created by a formula based on need as determined by U.S. Census data. The city is then given discretion to undertake specific activities using the annual block grant funds. The City of Lancaster has used CDBG funds for the construction of the Avenue H overpass, resurfacing of Avenue K between 50th and 70th Street West, infrastructure improvements for Rite Aid and the Foxfield Industrial Corridor, 4th Street East improvements, inspection of 75 miles of sewer for maintenance of the city's sewer systems, and alley improvements property acquisition for the Mental Health Association, the proposed multi-service ambulatory care center, the realignment of 3rd Street East, the old fairgrounds, and the James C. Gilly Park in the North Downtown Transit Village. Construction of the Children's Center of the Antelope Valley, the soccer complex, public services such as the CARES program and Parks Recreation and Arts Fee Waiver program, rehabilitation of blighted apartment complexes, emergency repair programs, programs for the physically disabled, code enforcement officers, and staff to administer the various programs and projects. 
Some of the proposed activities in the 2008 CDBG program are required to be in compliance with HUD, such as the administration of the CDBG programs, providing fair housing service, and the repayment of five Section 108 loans. Programs for the 2008 CDBG program are the Parks, Recreation, and Arts Fee Waiver Program, the Lancaster Cares Program, Juvenile Offender Service Program, funding of two code enforcement officers, construction of the James C. Gilly Park, installing water conservation sy systems in four city-owned parks, and improvements within identified blighted neighborhoods in the core of the city of Lancaster. The financial impact is the HUD grant of $1,370,043 to the City of Lancaster. After approval by the City Council, the City of Lancaster will be awarded $1,370,043 in Community Development Block Grant Entitlement Funds and continue with approved projects. The list of the proposed projects for the 2008 CDBG one-year action plan is in compliance with the city's five-year consolidated plan and strategy, the city's housing element, and the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Staff is recommending the approval of the 2008 one-year CDBG action plan. Any communications? No communications and no speaker cards. And any questions? One point of clarification. The staff report it mentions code, code enforcement officer A and B. Are that's just to delineate two separate code enforcement officers, or do we have different types of code enforcement? No, it's officers? just to delineate two separate okay. officers. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, close the public hearing. Any discussion? No, sir. Is there a motion? Yes, I'll move that we. Um, I move that we approve the uh, Community Development Block Grant for the 2008 Program Year Action Plan. Is there a second? I second that motion. Let's vote. That's unanimous. Oh, we have new business, and we'll hear from the city manager. Thank you, Mayor Paris and City Council members. Um, at your last meeting, you appointed some members of the Council to organizations and committees that require Council membership. You did hold off on the appointments of the six remaining that fall into that category. <coughs> and at this time, it would be appropriate for the Mayor to make nominations to um, those committees. Um, do you want me to do them individually or all at once? Dave, can we do these all at once? Okay, for the North County Transportation Coalition, I would uh, appoint Ken Mann. For the High Desert Corridor, Ron Smith. And the alternate would be uh, Sherry Marcus. I got it right this time, didn't I? <laughs> uh, Southern California Association of Governments and Regional Council. Uh, I will take that along with Sherry Marquez, Marcus. And the League of California Cities, Desert Mountain. Division, I'll take that along with the alternate being Ron Smith. League of California Cities, Los Angeles County, Div County Division, I'll take that with the alternate Ron Smith. And the Edwards Air Force Base Restoration Advisory Board, uh, I guess I will take that with the alternate being Ed Cilio. Uh, and when I say alternate, you can assume that uh, that means you're probably going to attend. So, <laughs> uh, do we need a vote on that, or is that the appointments? Uh, I believe you need a vote. Yeah, can, vote. can someone refresh my memory of when the Re Restoration Advisory Board meets? That is the one that I actually don't know. I know it's at various times late in the afternoon. I think it's once every other month, but I'm not certain. Do you know oh. that, Randy? I'll tentatively accept, accept that to I make sure it works. Thank you. And both of you were on the sanitation district last year. Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll second. I'll second those nominations. Any discussion? Let's vote. It's approved unanimously. Uh, 
Uh, Mr. Rosigi, and anything else? Okay, thank you. Uh, we now have a report from the city attorney. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, you have before you a uh, proposed ordinance which amends uh, Chapter 2.24 of the Lancaster Municipal Code relating to the Planning Commission and specifically uh, provides for the appointment of Planning Commissioners by the Mayor to conform with the Government Code uh, sections uh, subject to the um, approval of the City Council. Um, there are some other conforming changes within that chapter uh, but that is, in essence, the uh, the, um, the changes that are made. There is there is one change that uh, that I would uh, propose just for clarity, and that is in the uh, in section 2.24060. That's the removal from office. It currently reads that whenever, in the opinion of the mayor or upon a vote of the majority of the city council, the best interests of the city shall be served thereby any commissioner of the Planning Commission may be removed from office by a majority vote of the council. There was a phrase left out of that uh, last line, uh, and it should, should read, may be removed from office by the mayor or a vote of the a majority vote of the city council. <coughs> so I would uh, request that the words by the mayor or be inserted after uh, the word office and prior to the word by in the last line of that section. I'm, I'm stumbling because I'm, I'm what I uh, eventually want to do, meaning either this meeting or next meeting, is I want to spin off the architectural and design, the architecture and design aspect of the planning commission, and form a, a second planning commission with the uh, uh, with those responsibilities being undertaken by that commission. Uh, do we want to do that all at once, or do we want to? This ordinance obviously doesn't cover that that topic. My recommendation is that uh, you go ahead and introduce this ordinance, um, and that um, you can go ahead and adopt this, and then we'll amend it um, to provide for the second um, planning commission. And we may, in fact, deal that with just simply add additional sections to this chapter to uh, to deal with that uh, second commission. Um, the other thing that, and there's obviously been to some discussion about the number of planning commissioners, and you may want to consider that the current provision is for five, because um, that yes, was our prior. I, I would direction. want the, the current revision of the ordinance to make that seven. Then, then I would also suggest that we uh, change section 2.24.010, uh, where it says that the planning commission for the city composed of five commissioners, uh, that we add the words prior to five at least five but not not to exceed seven okay good and that's for the the period of two years is that correct yeah they serve for a term of two years okay great uh so i'll make the motion to introduce the ordinance and then what do we vote on at next meeting is that how you vote on it now uh after the introduction and then it'll be back on the uh, consent calendar at the next meeting for adoption Okay, do I open a public hearing first? No, there's no public hearing on this. It's just a, a motion. I have one and a speaker card, Mr. Mayor. If there are any speaker cards, then we should entertain those. Okay, great. Uh, well, should we do that before we get the second? or? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, Scott Pelka? Uh, I was. Uh, I believe his item was for CA1. CA1. My mistake. I apologize. You can talk on this one if you want. <laughs> I saw a planning commissioner. Okay. I'll second. I'll second the mayor's I, motion. Um, okay. Mm. I, I have, with the amendments that I propose. With the amendments, yes. I don't think I have three votes for this, but I would respectfully disagree on 2.24.060 about removing planning commissioners from office, and that the process we're following to put them in office is uh, nomination or appointment by the mayor and then ratification by the city council, I think removal of the planning commissioner should follow the same path. Uh, quick head count. I would support that. That's what I thought. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you know, I think you, you have a right to, to hear my point of view on it. Certainly. I think the Planning Commission is, is an incredibly powerful, vital part of our city. 
I also think it is the the one area of the city that is most uh, most vulnerable to inappropriate conduct and inappropriate influences. And if at least for the next two years that I'm mayor, the the moment I see that, that person's going to be removed from the planning commission. And that's why I want the mayor to have it. What I don't want it to be is a political football. Also, in the past, the philosophy of the planning commission was that each member reflected the views uh, and, uh, and thought processes to some extent of the individual council member that appointed them. That's not the way the, the my reading of the statute envisioned a planning commission. A planning commission is to adopt the goals of the council as a whole and make those things happen. And if any of these people obstruct that uh, that progress and that forward momentum, I don't want to. I don't want six months of political wrangling. I'm just going to remove them. Uh, and that's why I think the mayor has to have that that authority. Hopefully, it'll never be exercised. I think with the seven people that we're going to be appointing, it would never be exercised. But in the past, in the past 20 years, there have been times in this city when the mayor should have had the authority and the power to get rid of questionable people who are engaged in questionable activities. And that's simply not going to happen anymore. Uh, and that's why I want it there. Uh, and okay, can we vote? Passes unanimously. Hey, does that mean I talked you into it? No, I think on the whole it was a good idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, now we have the appointments of the Planning Commission. Oh. Uh, everybody have a list of the names because I need I need a list. I can try to do them from memory. I only have their applications. I don't have the whole. Uh... Okay, well, somebody out there correct me if I'm wrong. We have Raj Molly. We have Sandy Smith. We have uh, Jim Vos. Uh, Danny Jacobs. Uh, help. Dana Haycock. Larry Berkey. Larry Berkey. And, and Jonathan Urban. Jonathan yeah. Urban and they would be the seven. Now, would we have to would have to seat five today and the two uh, after the next meeting when we? Right. Our current code only allows a uh, planning commission of five, and so okay. I need two of them would here. not take office until the ordinance becomes effective. <laughs> okay. If you don't volunteer, I'm going to have to appoint two of them. Who do you? Who do you uh, Jonathan and uh, uh, Urban. Do you want to pick two at random here, or <laughs> <laughs> well, they were the last two. It would be Jonathan Urban and Larry Berkey. They will take their seats when we pass the ordinance. But the first five would be uh, the uh, Sandy Smith. And, 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 and just for clarification, that would be 30 days after the second reading and adoption of the ordinance. So 30 days following the next council meeting. Okay, and I and I would June, roughly June 27th, and I would direct them to the other two to sit there as non-voting members until the ordinance passes, so that they don't have any downtime. That's a good idea. Uh, okay, so that's the motion. Is there a second, Mr. Mayor? I have a, a concern about um, not about the uh, the appointments oh, per se. Public hearing too. Oh, well, let's let's take, let's take care of that first. Let's take care of that first. Okay. Any communications? No, sir. And we have one speaker, which is uh, Mr. Pelka. Yes, I have some general concerns with uh, uh, appointing three people from uh, various uh, uh, real estate companies, uh, especially one of them, I think, believe Mr. Voss is uh, representing uh, Walmart and also uh, one of the other um, 
developers in the area here uh, for the Walmart project at 60th Street uh, uh, West, and I don't think he should be on the planning commission. I also don't f I feel that the uh, other realtor who works for uh, Bazigian Realty, because of his connection with uh, uh, his family over here, should be on the, on the planning commission. I feel that Mr. Jacobs uh, should not be on the planning commission because of his uh, affiliation with uh, runners. Uh, Frank Visco, uh, in the past of getting his position on the fair board, and the influence is there, and also uh, his affiliation with you, uh, with your donations to the fair board to get your name on the buildings. Uh, and also, I also want to question how the decision was made on your part, and who was also present there at the time uh, for these uh, seven names, uh, how they were decided upon. Uh, who, who from the council here was there at that point in time when the, this decision was made, when these seven names were decided? I'd like to ask you that. Mr. Paris? <coughs> I'm asking you who was Mr. Pelkey, that's not how this works. Well, you, you, that, that's you not how this works. If you have a public comment to make, if you have a public comment to make, you are this certainly free to comment. make it. How was the decision made for the Mr. Pelka, people? if you ask me a question, you let me talk. Thank you. I wish you'd ask that is not how public comment works. If you want to come up and make a public comment, I want to listen to you. If you want to ask me about my thought processes and decision making, you should do that in private. You should pick up the phone and call me. But I am not going to be cross-examined by you or anyone else. Now, I'm aware that previous mayors allowed that kind of conduct to occur. It will not occur on this city council anymore. Now, if you have a comment, make it. But you will not question any of us from that table. Are we clear? No, I'm not clear. Then basically, you're finished. Basically, you're trying to you're shut finished. Me up. Take you're your seat. To shut me up you're to finished. Say. Take your seat, or you're going to be removed. Are we really? clear? Interesting. Thank you. Our city government work. Before we before we get into discussion, just because there's a motion on the floor, I'll second, and then we can have a council discussion if that's okay. Sure. Uh, my concern is this: um, uh, as a council, we, uh, I guess as a council, we decided to, or, or maybe you chose to accept applications until May the sixth. That's correct. Uh, that's Tuesday, and uh, you've had a week, approximately to go through the applications, do whatever you need to do to, to pull out the uh, now seven best applicants that you could out of the 37 or so. Let me be clear on that. That's not what I did. What I did is I, I attempted to pick the seven that I thought would form the most effective group. And that does not mean picking the seven best. That means picking the seven that will work together the best for the good of the city. And, and that's what I attempted to do. If, if I were to do it, if I were sitting here and just picking one, my thought process would have been much different. Uh, I also recognize, however, that you and Mr. Mann and Sherry Mar Marcus and Mr. Smith may want additional time to think about this before you vote, and I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, I'm perfectly okay with, uh, with listening to any members of the public that have any comment about these individuals. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is, I, I make the appointment and you either uh, accept or reject them. It's not a situation where the council makes the selection. But the council does ratify your appointment. That's correct. And if you need additional time, I certainly want you to have it. Um, one, I think I would like an equal amount of time as you had to, to come up with your selection for the, the seven best, who, the seven who could work together the best. Um, and I, I don't see any downside to putting off this decision until, say, the following council meeting. That would be two weeks. That's our next regularly scheduled meeting, um, number one. Uh, number two, for myself to, to make the same informed type of decision to ratify that appointment, you've picked seven who you feel can work the best and do the, together and work do the best they can for the city. I don't know how to do that in the absence of 
having the applications of the other applicants. Mm -hmm. um, it, without uh, seeing the, uh, the mosaic of which you pick the seven, how do I know, how can I be comfortable with these are the best seven, uh, these seven fit as a, uh, out of the other 37. I, 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 I'm making the selection in the dark in the absence of what the other alternatives are. The, uh, that's because that's not your decision. Your, your decision is to either accept or reject. They're either qualified or they're not qualified in your opinion. It, the, the, it's very much like when the governor appoints a, a superior court judge. They, they can either approve them. I guess it would be an appellate court judge is where the assembly actually approves sure, it. Please. It's not working? It was such a great idea when we, when we came up with it, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, when the governor makes an appointment, he, he's, the legislature does not engage in a, in a discussion about somebody else that they would have preferred to take the seat. The discussion is limited to are these people qualified to sit in that capacity? And I don't see any difference uh, in any other in the appointments that mayors make. In fact, my understanding is that's how other cities do it. This is not a selection process that the council engages in. It's merely a, a review of the people I have selected, and you decide yes or no. And, and, and if you decide no, I am certainly not limited to people who have applied. I could go outside that. For the Planning Commission, the only requirement is they you know, they're 18 and they're residents of the, uh, of the city. So, you know, and, and I understand that's a different way of doing it, but I think that if we're going to move as rapidly as I want this city to move and, and build this city and, and face the, the challenges that are coming up, we're going to need to do that. We, we, cannot, we cannot have the old way of doing it. I, I'd like to jump in here if I may. I'm a little bit confused because obviously it's the body to the, of the council to ratify it as a total whole with a majority vote, but it's difficult to give a yes or no vote unless there's some clarity and giving that we didn't have time. I didn't receive my information until I think late noon and I was on the road in Los Angeles. I, didn't I get agree. Home if you need more time, I'm certainly happy to give it to you. But I want the, the uh, parameters of the decision to be clearly understood. If the city attorney hears anything that is not accurate, I'd like you to jump in. I will definitely do that, but I have not heard anything that is not accurate. So. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm happy to give you whatever time you want. My only concern is, is we don't have a planning commission. Sure. Okay. But had we maybe have gotten the uh, the applications earlier, maybe we wouldn't be in this predicament. Well, Mr. Mann, as you know, because we were exchanging emails, the you got the applications the within an hour of my decision, within an hour of my decision. Okay. Uh, as did the press. This is not something that was done in secret. This is something that I intend to do very openly. Uh, there wasn't any any grand conspiracy involved. These are the people I believe are the best people to represent our city on the planning commission, uh, and that's what my job is to to do. Sure, don't have a problem with what you stated, but Thank you. again, though, uh, you know, I, I don't believe I'm not. I can't speak for the rest of the council members, but given my 16 years of history as a planning commission. I think, uh, Commissioner, that when I give my vote, I want to make sure that it's informed and given the short time, and I understand the, the sense of urgency, but um, unfortunately I'm not responsible for the dilemma we're in. I'm, I'm willing to do whatever you want. I don't know if it's really a dilemma. I think that, you know, the mayor has already said that he'd give a continuance for two weeks to uh, so that you can review the applications. I know that the applications went out a couple of days ago. I think one of the uh, one of the issues here is, you know, that um, Councilman Cilia brought up about having the other applications. The government code doesn't specify the process the mayor has to take in order to come up with his five names or seven names. He could have drawn them out of a hat. He could have done, you know, had seven people already in mind before he was elected. Um, I think that um, in this respect, the mayor has taken the opportunity to open it up to the public 
you know, for probably the first time and, and took 37 applicants to review them. And I think that's a, that's, a, that's a big hurdle that we've taken in the city. So I don't think that the argument is there that uh, the other applicants should be considered. It's the, the quality and the qualifications of the seven applicants before us. And uh, I wouldn't mind a, a continuance either uh, so that the other council members can review those uh, seven applications. Well, let me shorten the argument then. Uh, Mr. Mayor, are you willing to release the other 30 applications uh, to the rest, to myself and the rest of the council members for a review? No, I'm not. And the, the reason I'm not is because the law is very clear on it. The, the appellate court went great, to great length in the Wilson decision to discuss precisely this. There's several reasons why you don't do that. One is just the simple embarrassment issue of people disclosing things they may not normally disclose and then making it a public record. It, it, it defeats candor. It defeats the, the, uh, the willingness of people to be forthcoming. And the case, uh, the Wilson case, discusses it thoroughly. The, there's a pre these are pre-decisional documents, and they're privileged. And I'm going to protect that privilege. The only reason I released all of their names is because they all consented to the release of their names. Uh, and so, no, I'm not. Now, you, you do have all the names of everybody that applied. Uh, I don't see any reason why you need to, to look at their applications. If you want to look at the, if you want to look at them individually, I suggest you call them and get a copy from them. But I think that those things are, are privileged and confidential, and they're going to remain so. <clears throat> Isn't that inconsistent, though? I mean, obviously, if we're at least I know that I ran on a platform of open and honest government. I can't see what the issue would be. The Planning Commission is a public health office, uh, and we're still going through the ratification process, so I, I can't figure out how that could be any different than when I decided to run for city council, and then there's a, a process that one goes through to disclose information. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit at a loss here. Well, there's a, there's a huge difference because, as you know, and as I know, when you run for public office, you're running with the bulls and people are going to say everything and anything. What we're attempting to do here is get qualified, competent people to sit on that planning commission and fulfill the goals and principles laid down by this council. I think that if we uh, open them up to the public in the ways that you suggest, it's one contrary to the law. The, the court has clearly expressed that I am not supposed to do that. And so what you're asking me to do is violate the law for a political idea of, of something you ran on, and that's not going to happen. What I'm going to do is follow the law and follow the rules and be as open with this community as I possibly can within the guidelines of that law. Mr. McKenna, maybe you can help me wrap my head around that idea. Uh, look, thinking of Wilson v. Was it Superior Court? I don't know. Um, that Governor Wilson, the courts ultimately ruled that Governor Wilson had, uh, uh, in, through the deliberative process, the ability to hold back those applications. But who they were holding it back from was the public and the media. And he was, he was the single individual making that make not true. true not true who he was holding it back from was the public the media and the legislature that had to approve these people that he actually chose for the appointments uh, and and you know as well as i do and in fact i sent you an email yes that any email i send to this council they are free to disclose it to the press and anyone else but the moment i disclose it to this council we are disclosing it to everyone we know that you folks should know it because that's the new rule here. Anything we talk about in emails, you get to read. Uh, and and I, I honestly don't understand the debate here. You have the names of the people. We know most all of them. I mean, it's not like they're, they're strangers to any of us. And if you want to see their applications, call them up and ask for it. But let them be the one to decide whether or not their privacy is violated. I think, I think once again, Councilman Mann, that you're taking that one jump of talking about ratifying and having open government. It is open government. We're not doing a ratification process of going through the other 30 names. We're going through a ratification process of going through the seven names. 
uh, some of you might wish that you had the opportunity to pick and choose from the 37, but that's not the case. So I think it is open and honest government. The uh, names were released, the applications are released, and we're discussing the seven in front of us. We're not discussing the other 30. And uh, so I think that it's very valid to uh, follow the law uh, that the Supreme Court decided. Can I say one thing? Um, I looked over the applications of these seven people that <laughs> Mayor Paris has appointed, and that was what I understood, that he's looked these applications over, and I think what he's saying is he's looking for that synergy. He's looking for a group of people who can work together, work well. Um, I, I looked over the applications of these people, and um, not all of them are realtors. Uh, Jonathan Irvin has got a military background. I appreciate that. We've got Edwards Air Force Base. Um, what I saw was what I thought Mayor Paris was doing, was looking for a synergy for some people who are going to work together and work well together. And um, I, I didn't see anything there that I had any questions about. What's the motion on the floor? The motion on the floor is to approve the uh, five, uh, with the two remaining to sit. Got it. I, I have one last remaining concern, and um, Mr. Mayor, it doesn't pertain to you per se. It does. It does in a way. But let me uh, allow me to finish my thought here. Sure. It's, it's not. Sure. It's not uh, completely formed. Um, I may stumble through this a little bit. Uh, but allow me to get my thought process out. <clears throat> I was in the last 24 hours. I've been contacted by more than one individual about a um, event held at your house. That in, you mean the event that was reported in the press, and, uh, and I told everybody I was going to have. Yeah, that one. I didn't read it. Didn't read it in the press. Um, but is this is this uh, event at your house Friday night? We're talking the same event. Yes. Okay. Um, well, then I can, I can say a, a lot and, uh, and just summarize that uh, a substantial number of the uh, applicants were at your house for a... a uh, Eleven of them were. Okay. Um, our city manager, our interim city manager was there. Our planning director was there as well as, as some other elected officials and other, other folks. Uh, Ms. Mar Mar Marcus was there and Mr. Smith was there. Uh, Danita Wynn was there. My wife was there. Am I missing anybody, Carol? That's it. Um, my, my concern is this, and I would like an opinion from our, our city attorney, uh, because, because I, I don't know the answer to this. And there is an exemption in the Brown Act for social events. That's clear. That's correct. One is... Uh, yeah, to me, this is getting close to the line. I don't know if it steps over. If there is a substantial number of the uh, applicants to sit on the planning commission are there, and a majority of the council is there, and their their uh, decision to make whether they're going to sit on the planning commission or not is it's it's so close that the agenda has already been posted. Is I, I would disagree. I can tell you the if what I, we did. What we did is we made certain that we were all at separate tables. The Brown Act uh, it contemplates us making a decision that's not in, a, in the public forum of, of the council. We didn't even discuss it. The, the purpose of that, uh, that dinner was I wanted to see how people uh, interacted together. Uh, and rest assured that there will be events at my house for the next two years involving everyone involved in the leadership of this city. I think it's important for us to socialize together. I think it's important for us to become friends. But there will never be a situation where any public business that is up for decision is ever discussed. And in fact, the next event, I was going to invite members of the press as long as they didn't report on the individual dinner conversations because that keeps people from uh, relating to each other. But, um, just, just so we're clear how it's going to happen. I think the idea of putting all the applicants in the room with, with the key members of city staff uh, who they'll interact with, the city manager and the planning director, is a stupendous idea. I think that would give you a lot of insight into how they would operate together. 
that's the very reason I think there's a problem with the majority of the council being there, in that they get to see that same thing, and, and that I believe that would influence how they would vote tonight. I think you could have everyone from from the president on down to the to a street sweeper there. I don't think there's a problem until there's a you've invited a majority of the council. Now, you is, know, is, is I, that a gray area? I, I, yeah, I it is. I don't even, I don't even I don't, think it's a gray area from a, a Brown Act situation. But what you're really saying is that three of us have had a chance to observe all of these people and how they act together, and two of you have not. But the reality is, is that if I invited the two of you, you wouldn't have come. I mean, you know, it's not a secret here. Uh, the uh, but to try to paint this uh, as a brown act situation is simply not true, not legally valid, and is, is you know, quite honestly, Ed, it's kind of beneath you. But if you want to come to the dinners, you're more than welcome. I need an invitation first. Okay, well, now I'm publicly inviting you whenever I have a dinner where the council, any members of the council are invited, you can come. Okay. Uh, Mr. McEwen, do you concur with the mayor's interpretation? Yes, I do. Yeah, I would. I will. Uh, as we said, from time to time, we will disagree. Yes. And this is one of those times we disagree. Okay, but what, are you going to come if I invite you? <laughs> <laughs> Carol, what are you serving? <laughs> That's not fair. Okay, do, what do you want to do? Do you want to vote or do you want to continue? My request to... would still be that we'd be allowed the two weeks so that both Ed and I can be, uh, again, I think there was some, <clears throat> potentially there's some not knowing what was discussed Friday, but obviously we, given the shortage of the time from yesterday at noon until today, and I worked today the entire day, I would have loved to ask questions of the seven and and I do I, I make an, a, a different interpretation I don't have a problem with someone working together as a group because I think the last Planning Commission worked well and they were appointed by all five of the City Council members and I think that we work together as well as a team so uh, I might argue that point the second thing is is when I I ratify and give my vote on on seven individuals in this particular case. I also have a perception of how I see the city evolving. And I'd like to be able to uh, to make sure that when I vote either yes or no or abstain, I want to make sure that it's an informed decision. And given the time frame, I don't think I just had adequate time. Mr. Ed, McEwen. I, I'd be curious as to what Ed thinks. Do you need additional time? I would like to have the, the additional time. Thank you. Mr. McKeon, can we just uh, do a continuance with the motion still on the floor? Or do we have to withdraw the motion and then proceed? No, you can do a motion to table that uh, would supersede the, uh, the motion. Would we have for two weeks and bring it back to the next meeting and then the motion still stands? That's what I would like to do. I'd like to move that we table uh, this, this motion right now. And, and for, for, two for clarity, what's, what's the date that the other two would begin? To Approximately June 27th. I don't know where that falls within the month, okay. which day of the week it falls on. But that's the effective date of the ordinance. So any time after the first meeting after that would be the first meeting they'd sit at. May I just say one thing, too, is that um, Councilman um, Mann, is that um, you can ask Terry Crosby to help you with uh, checking your emails from your work. I, I have access to the city... Uh, emails at my home and uh, I have access to my other workplace at the city so that I have those emails at all times and it's very convenient I get I have a blackberry and I get today I got 45 emails so that is that wasn't the problem it was the time and being able to ask questions and my sense is, is tonight we're not in that position to be able to do that based on the action that I get a sense that maybe the majority wants to take. So, <clears throat> again. Actually, that might be a solution. I mean, are they all here? Or, or the, you could question them now if you want. Just a thought. 
I wouldn't so, want to question them in public any any more than you would. Okay. So I have a motion on the on the floor to table. I'll second. Okay. Passes unanimously. C two. Okay. What's C two? Is this the meeting times? Yes. Okay. Good. Oh. Uh, Okay, one of the things we talked about was changing the meeting times. Uh, I don't want to do the motion tonight, but I do want to get some public comment. Uh, and, uh, oh, Mr. Pelka again. Uh, I'm adamantly opposed to changing the meeting time, especially to earlier in the day. I think it should be actually uh, moved up an hour to 7 o'clock to give the people who work down below, which is approximately 35% of this community, they have to travel down to L.A. and uh, other various areas of time to be able to get up here and participate in this public forum. And that's basically all I need to say. Thank you. Uh, what my thinking is, is that what I, what I see as a problem is we have people making decisions that affect all of your lives in ways that you oftentimes don't appreciate. And those decisions are sometimes being made at 10, 11 o'clock at night by people who get up sometimes at 5 o'clock in the morning. It makes no sense to me. Uh, so what, I'm, what I want to do is figure out a way that we can start the meetings earlier in the afternoon and then have the public comment uh, later in the in the uh, evening so that we can get rid of all of the the two hours that people aren't going to be commenting on and there seems to be some procedure and some precedent for that with other cities uh, uh, Miss Bryan was very uh, diligent in finding out what other cities do and I'd also like to hear from the rest of the council because, quite honestly, this is something that affects you, the folks that come to the meetings. And so I want you to participate in the discussion and see what works for you. It seems to me that you folks don't want to sit here for two hours listening to a bunch of nonsense to get to the part that you want to make a comment on or that you want to be involved in. And that's what I would like to discuss. Any thoughts? Are there, are there more public speakers? That's the only one so far. But if anybody wants to join in, you're welcome to come up. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I think I think that uh, an adjustment on the on the time of the meeting. Uh, could you do be need to fill out a speaker card. Thank you. Could could be appropriate now that we're on the internet and streaming and um, and also on the um, on the television. If somebody can't get cable, uh, I know that I I talked to people that were up in Northern California and they were watching the meeting online and uh, so that was always the concern before that somebody can see it now with email also I mean this uh, the lady who spoke tonight we have an email from her on a comment on an agenda item so there's a lot more flexibility and I think that there there is some merit to saying that if we started all the business and the awards and the boilerplate and the consent calendars and those things and give people an opportunity to to be able to make their comments at 6 o'clock rather than at 10 o'clock then there there is some merit to consider on that uh, can we do something where they, they can let us know on the internet if there, there is going to be public comment? I mean, what are our options here? Um, anyone can communicate in writing if they can't make it to the meeting. They have that option now because there are people who work at night who can't be here in the day. So there's always an option to do that. We could certainly publicize that option more and make it available maybe through the Internet as well, too. You know, one yeah, of my I, I don't see any reason why we can't do it on the Internet as well. It would simply be a matter of printing those uh, or making copies of each of those emails to uh, or Internet, whatever it's a, if it's a, a, on the website somehow, whatever the, the format of the, the input could be made available to all the council members and made part of the record. Okay, now, now, just so you're clear, that doesn't mean that you're, you're going to be limited to communicating to us by email. It means you would notify us that you want to speak by email, and we would separate that item off so that we would have that 
item in the evening so everybody could engage in the discussion. If it's an item that you need to have in the evening, because some of the public discussion, people live here and they, they can do it at the regular time. Uh, if, uh, if, if I don't get a stream of cards coming in, I will assume that people agree that this might be a workable method. Is, is that okay? Yes, and we have uh, Ms. Goss. Ms. Goss, did you have something you want to say? I'm one of those people that get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I was here last year till 1 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I would be very disappointed if I couldn't hear all the comments on all the agenda items. If you want to do your awards at a different time, that's perfectly fine. I can't get here any sooner than the time I arrive now. And I cannot spend my time at work emailing you saying I want this comment or that comment. And I was enlightened tonight by this other gentleman about the selection of the Planning Commission. I would not have found that out if I hadn't attended this and you didn't offer it at this time. So I would very much oppose a change of time. Thank you. Uh, okay, what, what I'll do is I'll consider everything and, and come up with a suggestion next week or looking, next meeting. Looking at what other cities do, it seems to be other, with the exception of towns large enough that they are the county seat, Fresno, Riverside, San Bernardino, they all seem to start in the five to seven o'clock range. And I remember when we moved from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m., we picked that time because we did have a concern of, about our commuter population. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, are, are you considering a, a midday, uh, midday session in addition to an evening session? Or yeah, what, what, I think yeah, Beverly Hills, what they do is they, they actually start at 2 or 3, uh, and then they break for dinner, and then they come back and do the, public com the items that are public comments. No, I might be wrong. I'm doing this for memory, but I think it was Beverly Hills that does that. Uh, the, uh, it, it just, what I want is, I don't want evergreen contracts being voted on at 11 o'clock at night. And I don't want decisions that lead to recalls being voted on at 11 o'clock at night when people are not functioning as best as they can. Now, I take a nap, you know, I, I, I sleep two hours before I come, but as David McEwen pointed out, he doesn't have that luxury. Uh, and so that's what I'm trying to do, is I'm just trying to increase the ability of all of us to, to make better decisions. From a personal standpoint, whatever, if we choose some daytime hours, that's going to require some uh, changes on the employment front for me in terms of, of scheduling and whatnot. So we're going to have to be pretty specific about it. Okay. I, 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 I certainly want to work with all four logistics there. To make certain that, uh, I mean, so well, tell, me, <clears throat> tell me what you're able to do and what you think is appropriate, uh, but don't violate the Brown Act, so do it individually. And then we'll well, maybe, what, two weeks. maybe what would be good would be for maybe some recommendations so that there's Maybe a, a choice because obviously like that idea. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. And if you have yours, you know, email them to me, and we'll we'll make it a a selection process. Okay. Is that good? Thank you. Very good. Okay. Uh, oh, let's take a five minute break. Okay. That probably means ten, but. <laughs> Shall we get back to our seats? Is the mic working okay? Good. Okay. Councilman Cilio passed me a note, and in the, issue, in the uh, uh, order to keep everything transparent, I'll read it to you. It's a fortune cookie, and it says, A solid challenge will bring forth your finest abilities. <laughs> uh, let's go on to CA3. I do what I can. Uh, That's the vice mayor. Uh, thank you, mayor. You know, well, first off, I'd like to thank staff and especially Mr. Williams and uh, Mr. Buzigian for 
doing just a great job on moving us forward. He's one of the leaders in this valley when it comes to water. I know for about six months, one of, a couple of the things we've been doing, not only publicly but behind the scenes, I know I initiated, I don't know how many months ago it was, it might have been six months ago, on looking at xeriscaping uh, as part of the uh, ordinances for uh, new homes that are being built. We also moved forward um, a number of months ago about creating an ad hoc committee to look at those types of ordinances and forming an ad hoc committee with the city of Palmdale, two members from their city council and two members from ours. Uh, always working with other agencies take take a little bit of time and um, had some other meetings with Mr. Williams and Mr. Bozigi and I just feel like the time is that we need to just start moving forward and start moving the train and if the other people want to jump on board then they do and if not then, then they don't. And one of the concerns that I have and what we need to, what I believe we need to move forward, one is we have a new council, so I'd like to get a consensus on this to move forward. And we're at the point now at least, I think, as a city that we decided we need to do something with the xeriscaping. I think the city of Lancaster and the Antelope Valley uses about 330 gallons per day per capita. Um, city of Long Beach uses 150. Um, Santa Fe, New Mexico uses about 100. 70 to 75 percent of that is because of landscaping. And we have green lawns out here. We have all this landscaping, a lot of runoff. But so since we all probably, I don't think there's anybody on this dais that doesn't agree that we need to do something drastic, something moving forward, um, we're, at that, we're at that point now. And as I always like to explain it, we've already decided we want to paint the house. Now we've got to pick which color it's going to be. So what I'm proposing is that with a consensus that we give staff direction to come back and set a time to do a workshop, not a study session that we've done before where we get information, but this is the time that the staff brings forward to us ideas on the xeriscaping, ideas on the, on the landscaping. We say, yes, we don't want any front lawn. Yes, we maybe want 10% lawn in the back. Now, I've looked at the city ordinances for... Um, um, Victorville. They have a list of plants that you can use. You can't use any plants but those plants. Maybe we don't want to be as drastic as them. Maybe we want a few other plants. But this is the time that we have to actually sit down and decide. So uh, that's what I brought forward, that we um, set up a workshop to let staff have a direction to look at aggressive xeriscaping. And uh, we can discuss some other things at that time also. And it's mostly for the landscaping ordinances that we need to provide. They've already been contacting the city of Palmdale. I'd like at that we ultimately get to a point that we have an ad hoc committee with two of them. It needs to be done valley-wide. I would, I would like to appoint the vice mayor as the city's representative on the water issue, meaning that ultimately this is going to have to be a regional solution. Uh, and we need somebody to take the laboring ore. Uh, you, you, your knowledge of the water situation is is really remarkable, and uh, so how would I do that, Mr. City Attorney? Any suggestions? If if I understand your comments, I, I think what you're talking about is an ad hoc committee, um, which would be some uh, chaired by the vice mayor. Okay, and he can he can create whoever he wants on the committee. That, that would be the motion, that he chair the ad hoc committee and that the uh, participants and whoever makes up the committee are to be chosen by uh, the vice mayor. That'd be fine. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay. You want to discuss it? Short discussion. I had, I had a, about an hour-long conversation with someone today on, on water issues and uh, much as what Councilman Smith said, that water does not know boundaries doesn't know lines on a map. Uh, this, the solutions to our, our, our water shortage, and we do have a water shortage, is uh, regional cooperation. The city can't solve it. The county can't solve it. The state can't solve it. Every political entity is going to have to sign off on the solution, and, and every entity is there's going to have to be something in it for each of them. It's going to take a lot of give and take and a lot of cooperation. Uh, for anybody who wants to argue that we aren't in a water shortage, we have projects that can't get will serve letters for water. It's already happening on the residential side. It would be a crime if we sat here and did nothing and let this go to the point where we don't can't serve our commercial or retail uses with water. One of the other things I'd like to chime in here is um, part of the reason why some of those cities to the south also use um, 
less water is because of the density levels. <clears throat> so I think that although I'm highly supportive of um, Councilman Smith, because water happens to be a passion of mine, given I've sat on three different private water companies here in, in Lancaster, um, I would hope that we not only, one, we establish a water policy about how the city is going to move forward, but, um, but it's comprehensive, not just on new construction, but I think we may even need to incorporate steps that need to be taken to, to do some retrofitting of some of the existing older neighborhoods. Because I'm sure that there's, you know, maybe we need to be more inclusive of how to possibly reach an air, a point where we, we do get some major reductions. Because my biggest concern right now is commercial development, which is the lifeline to sales tax revenue, has been shut off. And I just think we need to turn every stone over to, to try to figure out how we can, whether we have to do some trade outs or whatever the case may be to, to, to ultimately. So I think it needs to, well, not just when we're talking about landscaping, maybe on new construction, I think we need to figure out maybe how we can find some cooperativeness and maybe go back into some older neighborhoods. Let me, let me toss an idea out there. It, it is something we used in our goal setting sessions for public safety. Um, we didn't know how we were going to get there, but we were going to measure whether we have enough boots on the ground in public safety by looking at radio logs. Is it, it, do the deputies on the ground ever have enough free time to just routinely patrol? In this case, I think we can monitor that number, that 330 number for residents. Are we doing a good job? I think that could be our metric to measure. No, ab absolutely. And, and the suggestions we've already discussed, and Randy Williams, I've discussed this before. It was an idea that staff was coming up with about retrofitting is that, you know, the idea and the explanation was if you had a builder that came in that wanted to build 300 homes and and they could zero scape and, and set the standards within that house and the facility to get it down to 150 gallons per day per capita we still don't have the water for them. So then if they could turn around and say, okay, well, this is what you have to do. You've got to retrofit 300 homes that are doing 320 gallons per day per capita and get them down to 150, now you have a net gain. And so there's there's a number of ideas like that. One, But very, very strongly, I believe we have to start setting the standard for any new development also. Uh, these are discussions that we can do at the workshop. Those are, are more long-term things, things that we need to do. There's also an inverted water table that we have to talk, uh, inverted water rate table that we need to talk about. Um, but those are things that we have to involve other entities. But I believe that the city needs to move forward as fast as we can of what we can do and not wait for anybody else. And then hopefully everybody comes along with us, uh, just like we did in law enforcement. You know, we're not going to wait till other areas do it. We're going to put more cops on the street. We're going to implement new programs. And uh, so all those ideas are valid. Uh, for the workshop. I'd like this first workshop, though, to be to really start looking at the ordinances, the nuts and bolts. Staff needs a little bit more direction than just come up with a zero escaping plan, because if they come back with one, then we're going to have to discuss it and send it back. I think it's much better if we sit down and say, give us a, give us a menu to choose from. We like, you know, this from menu A and this from menu B, and this is what, uh, what we'd like to work on. But uh, all those ideas uh, are good and valid, and we need to look at them, not only on the densities, but uh, also the trade-offs. I want to be clear on this. What we're, what, what I'm giving you the responsibility to do is come up with initially a, uh, a schedule, a calendar of when these decisions are going to be made and putting together the recommendations for what those decisions are going to be. It, it cannot be stressed enough that this water problem is huge. It can stagnate us. It could put us back 20 years. It's going to have to be an aggressive community effort. And that's what we're entrusting you with, is the schedule for that and the people to put together the team to fix this. Okay. Mr. McEwen, did you have something? Yes, I do. The, it, looking at what listed on the agenda. It talks about discuss and direct staff to set up a water conservation workshop for the council and then discuss aggressive landscape standards. 
I don't see anything in there that would apprise anybody that we were going to contemplate an ad hoc committee. And so I'm concerned that the, the actual action being taken is to direct the appointment of an ad hoc committee as opposed to directing staff to set up a, a water workshop. Um, I think, you know, it's kind of all related, but I, but I think that to, to do that uh, correctly, that we ought to bring the ad hoc committee question back at the next and put it on the agenda as the uh, creation of an ad hoc committee. Okay, let's, let's move it to the next meeting, but whoever writes up the agenda, make it clear. I, the motion I'm going to make is to appoint uh, the deputy, I mean the vice mayor, the water czar. Yeah, that, okay. that would be fine, and that's, that's obviously a better procedure to. Okay, and do, do I have a consensus from the? Do I have a consensus from the council that we can direct staff to come back with some dates and start doing the groundwork to put together so we can choose and start creating an ordinance uh, for uh, for conservation. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let's do a motion to table it and bring it back. Well, you don't need a motion to table because it really wasn't on the agenda yeah, in the first place. Okay. So just withdraw the motion and then um, okay. uh, we'll put it on the next okay. agenda. We've given staff direction. So. But okay. the other part of Mr. S uh, Council Member Smith's motion was to direct staff to come back with dates for the water workshop. That Thank would stand. You. Thank you. I, I don't know that we need Let me have a card there. a vote okay, on that. That is just direction with consensus of the council. Check the card, see if it's on this topic before I move on. It is not. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's move on to uh, CA4, and that's my issue. Uh, I, I've had some discussions with the city manager, uh, and what I would like the staff to do is to come up with an ordinance, specifically this city attorney to split off the architecture and design elements of the planning commission and we'll have an architectural and design planning commission deal with those. The reason for this is when I was on the planning commission with Mr. Mann, uh, we had wonderful ideas about the design of this community and this was 15 years ago, 10 years ago. Now you're dating this. Long time ago. That was 20. Okay. 20 years ago. Great ideas. I was 20. Oh, okay. <laughs> Great ideas uh, about the design that we should be engaging in. And then you get tied up with conditional use permits and general plans and land use planning, and it never happened. And now what we have is we have this hodgepodge of boxes in the city of Lancaster and like other communities. I want to see that changed. I want this planning commission to come up with clear design standards that when you cross Avenue in, you know you're in a new city. Uh, unfortunately, I think it's too late for us to do a theme for the city, you know, like Santa Barbara has a Spanish theme, th things of that nature. But it's not too late for us to do themes for areas of the city. But there is no reason for us to look the way we look. Uh, and and I think that if we had a separate planning commission to deal with those issues, uh, it would be much more beneficial for all of us. Uh, the one thing I would like you to do, Mr. McEwen, in drafting that ordinance is take a particular, pay particular attention to the fact that I do not want to delay projects. I do not want to add a layer of bureaucracy that causes further delay. So we have to be very careful how we draft it. Uh, whatever decisions get made, I want them being made concurrently uh, and expeditiously. But at the same time, um, we can do a lot better with the design. And so that's the, the goal. And I will be drawing from the, uh, the applications that had been submitted uh, previously. And I would like to, again, open the application process to anybody else who th might think that this would be something they would be interested in. And give me a date, uh, Ms. Bryan, would be a good time, 10 days. And they'll be open for 10 days. I will release the names to the press. I will not release the applications, uh, just so that there's not there any, any uh, mistakes. Is there a re release on the forms now? Uh, yes, put a, put a checkbox. Actually, what I want is, is I want to clear, here. okay, a checkbox on the application. If they want it released, then I'll make the decision if I want to do it. Uh, but make sure it's clear that their names will be released. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, it will take us um, a couple of weeks at least to, to get an ordinance drafted and, and brought back. So probably we'll bring it back sometime in June. 
Okay, I, I will go ahead with the selection process, uh, assuming that it'll pass, and if it doesn't pass, then we'll just throw the names away. Uh, and do I need a motion now? No, I think direction to staff is, is sufficient. Okay, terrific. I'm, I'm glad you threw the party in there about not impeding the, the process. When you think of architectural review committees, I can't help but think of places like Palos Verdes where they spend yeah, eons of time right, talking about yeah. whether, whether this tree works or not. Right. And that's and, my biggest concern as well. Yeah. We don't, we, you know, one of the things I think the reason why we got a business-friendly award was because we have been moving in that direction. And the last thing we want is somebody coming to town, whether they're a commercial developer or a residential, and saying, now the process has been slowed down. The integration is key, and I will, I will testify to, uh, I remember during the general plan update in 97, 98, whenever that was, uh, sp thinking of, well, it is too late to do a theme for the city, and maybe we can do themes for different areas. So I understand how we can talk about it. It's a good idea, and it just never, you just never get around to it. So this is a good idea. And, and I will be having a dinner, and Mr. Wilson, you're invited if you want to come. <laughs> Maybe he and I will carpool. <laughs> Fran, you can come too. <laughs> okay, let's go on. Uh, oh, CA5. This is the solar energy. I would like to direct staff to take a serious uh, look and Tell us what we can do in regards to requiring solar energy panels on the uh, all future development. Uh, I want to know the commercial feasibility of it. I would like to know what the building industry thinks about it, uh, but what and whether or not they're available. I don't want to slow any projects down, but at the same time, I, I, I just don't understand why we're building houses without having so solar electrical generation on them from everything I've read but you guys are the experts on it, and so I would like a report on that issue. Can you do that for me? Mr. Mayor, can I jump in here? Sure. The Planning Commission took a look at a project uh, to do a test here about a year ago, also with wind, and it was, ex you know, not like we don't, we're, we're out of it. I think we had a bunch today, so okay. uh, well, I, I, I would like to see if maybe we could broaden that. Did and you mean at the meeting? Or? No, <laughs> okay. no, I'm talking about just out in the, the open. But if we could possibly broaden not only residential solar energy, maybe we need to take a look at um, the project was on a commercial development. I was quite impressed to find out that Lowe's, is considered, it's won numerous awards across the country for being green, which I was quite surprised. And they ran a test, and you know, when we think of wind generation, we think for, for electrical power, we, we often, we get scared and we think of the things that are often detached. Be, but that isn't what was proposed to the Planning Commission, and uh, I think it's got some merit. Maybe not necessarily in residential application, but clearly in commercial, because it was hard to tell that it was on the building. Could could we do both of those? But what I'm wanting the wanting you folks to do is come up with enough information that the new planning commission could draft an ordinance uh, for us to to enact, if possible. Okay. Mayor Paris, um, we can take we can look at both of those and come back with a date on when it would we could have that for you. And we and we would like you to be aggressive. Okay. I'm beginning to see a theme there with that. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you thinking more in terms of a requirement for solar or, or a financial incentive to ins to install it or, or either or? Well, at this point, I think we're open to anything, but I think ultimately it's going to be required. Not by us, by the state. We've talked about water infrastructure. I think at some point in time we're going to have to look at electrical infrastructure as well uh, for similar reasons. Okay. Now we have item number CA6, which is the Criminal Justice Commission. Uh, I want to appoint uh, Marvin Christ and Robert Paris, who is my brother, just so there's full disclosure. Uh, as co-chairs, uh, interim co-chairs of the Criminal Justice Commission. 
for the purpose of meeting with the sheriff's department, meeting with the citizens, and devising a commission that will uh, assist and uh, oversee the uh, the gang enforcement. We we need a component for the new jail uh, and anything else the sheriff's department feels that the uh, commission can assist them on. And I'm assuming that would be Neighborhood Watch. And what I'm going to do is fold AV War on Gangs into the Lancaster Criminal Justice Commission, so that'll be a component of it, of it also. The, uh, I don't, they will decide how big the commission should be, but this will be a real commission if the council approves it, and I'm assuming they're going to. Uh, they're going to be commissioners. It, it will have broad, sweeping impact on how we pursue the criminal element in this community. Uh, any discussion? And they report to? To us. Okay. I was just thinking in terms of... Uh, well, you thought it was me, didn't you? I, no, actually, I was thinking I was thinking in terms of staff and, and how they interact with the Sheriff's Department now. And how no, this, would, this would be a report gonna... to us. I, I don't want to add more bureaucracy to the Sheriff's already overburdened bureaucracy. Uh, but if we're going to drop this crime rate below Santa Clarita, it is going to require a massive amount of, of uh, citizen involvement. Uh, Marvin Christ has been the uh, the chairman of the, or you're the president of the AV Boosters, is Sheriff's Boosters, uh, and Rob Paris was a captain in the Highway Patrol, and so they and he's a sheriff reserve, and so they both have enough involvement to get this thing moving. Mm -hmm. Okay. And hopefully they will report back to us within 30 days as to how the commission should be comprised and the authority of it, and then we'll take applications and appoint. And, you know, all you folks that wanted to be on the planning commission, this is really the commission you should be on because it's going to have major impact, uh, just so you know. Mr. Mayor, we'll, we will need to establish the commission by ordinance, so... Yes, if you we'll, could. we'll draft that and bring that back to you. As well. Yeah, work with those two in drafting it, and and so we'll have it ready to go. Okay. Uh, and now we have uh, CA. Oh, do we have any public comment? Any of this? We'd skip. CA seven. We okay. uh, CA seven is uh, Councilwoman Mar Marcus. I apologize again for my voice. <laughs> Um, what I had wanted to do was ask for a consensus of the council to uh, come up with a committee of two. Um, and I was honestly thinking, um, because of Council uh, Member Smith's graphic arts background, that um, he could help out in this committee and come back with a couple of recommendations and designs for the uh, whole council to take a look at and uh, agree on one of them. Thank you. Uh, let's open it up for public comment, and we'll start with uh, Debbie Phillips. Thank you. Um, when I came into the meeting tonight, I came in a little bit late, and I noticed that Mayor Paris was saying that he, uh, at that particular item, they were discussing wanted to come to an agreement that works for everyone. And I'm hoping that this can also uh, apply to this issue. Um, my thoughts here are that to display the phrase, in God we trust, up there at the dais, at the very least implies that non-believers are unwelcome or unsuitable to appear before the council. The extreme interpretation of that would imply hostility towards citizens who do not share the council's collective religious belief. While it is true that the phrase is our national motto and appears on our currency, the widespread use or misuse of the phrase does not justify its display in public legislative settings where diversity should be encouraged and embraced. What you propose to do suggests favoritism for religious citizens and discrimination against those you consider to be godless citizens. I would like to read a list of individuals, some living and some dead, who likely would not support the motion presented by Councilmember Marquez. 
These individuals have made significant contributions as global citizens while publicly declaring themselves to be either atheists or agnostics or free thinkers. The bulk of these people are atheists or agnostics. The reason I'm reading this list is because I'm just one person in this community and I want you to know that there are many people out there who feel this way and these are names that you would recognize. You may be so surprised by some of these names, maybe not. So the first name on the list is, and I'm looking at my time to see how much time I have here, um, the Dalai Lama, spiritual leader of Tibet, Confucius, the Chinese social philosopher, Galileo, the Italian astronomer and philosopher, Helen Keller, author, activist, and lecturer, Albert Einstein, German theoretical physicist, Sigmund Freud, Winston Churchill, Marie Curie, Charles Darwin, Stephen Hawking, Carl Sagan, Mikhail Gorbachev, turn the page, turn the page. Andrew Carnegie, Lance Armstrong, Clarence Darrow, Arthur, Mil Arthur Miller, Samuel Clemens. We got, we got your gist. Thank Whether, you. Thank you. Mr. Pelka. I do not belong to any church in this community. Uh, I have a lot of friends that do. I welcome their freedom to go to any church they wish to go to, to worship any way they wish to worship, and I have no problem with that. What I have a problem with is the display of that in this public forum because there should be a, uh, a general separation of church and state. We should not have that in a uh, city uh, uh, council chamber or in any, any city meeting room. That is not uh, uh, that is available to the public and not uh, sanctioned by any church whatsoever. Uh, the main difference between myself and Debbie back there was the fact that primarily most of the people she mentioned were no longer living with us. A lot of people in Lancaster do live with us, and I think most of them would agree with me. So that is all I have to say. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. <laughs> Mayor Paris, uh, council members, and good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, in regards to CA7, I've tried to look at the pros and cons for displaying our national motto here in the chambers. And in my opinion, the biggest pro is that we are visibly displaying our faith, and, and I am speaking of those that believe in God. Uh, I would suggest that if we are to put a display that has our national motto, that we modify it. Uh, one here in the chambers. It would read as such, in God and the Los Angeles County Sheriff Department, we trust. <laughs> <laughs> this may seem humorous and not serious, so I'll cut to the chase and mention what really prompted me to speak tonight. And I am pretty serious about that because, I, as my grandpa taught me when I was young, God helps those who help themselves, and I truly believe in that, and I've lived my life that way I don't leave everything up to God although you have that guidance and that's a discussion for all night but but if our national motto is to be displayed in the chambers I would suggest the funds come from the personal account or accounts of our mayor and council members a second alternative would be a fund from the general public donations as such I would suggest to all council members keep public safety in mind as the number one priority when new projects are considered that will draw funds from the city's budget. In view of the economy and the crime issues in the city of Lancaster, I feel that funds for public safety is more important than funds for redecorating the city hall. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Burgess. Carol, do I have enough money to pay for that? <laughs> She's ignoring me. I'd be honored to pay for that, Mr. Burgess. Let me just um, <clears throat> say a couple of things. 
if my voice will allow me. When, when I brought this up, it was not for my religious beliefs. You wouldn't want to know what I would put up there if it were up to my religious beliefs. It would be a Bible verse. Um, like I said, for the almost two years that I came into the chamber, I always wondered why there wasn't something back there. My blood has got to run red, white, and blue. I'll just tell you that right now. This is something that's very dear to me, can be emotional to me. I feel like our Americanism is slipping away every day. Dennis Anderson just wrote an article the other day that expressed what Lancaster is about. And I really believe that Lancaster's are a remnant in this country that we love. I love America. I can't say that enough. So when I brought this up, it wasn't because of my religious background or my religious beliefs. It truly was Americanism, national pride, patriotism. The list that, that Debbie Phillips read, I, you know, I, I understand where she's coming from. But there's a list that I could give. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington, John Adams, John Quincy Adams. I could go on and on and on. That's what we're losing. And that's why I suggested that. In God We Trust, it's our national motto. It has nothing to do with church and state. It has everything to do with that flag right there. Absolutely. So I hope no one misunderstands. I'm not bringing my religious beliefs into here. I'm bringing my Americanism and my patriotism in here. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The funds, um, actually... I've gotten some um, examples of what could go on this wall. One of them being our national seal, which includes In God We Trust. That's why I've asked for a committee and a graphics arts person to, to come up with some things that we could agree on as a council. And I, I'd still like to see that happen. And Mr. Bozikin said that um, we do have those funds put aside and and actually, they're very they're very nominal, aren't they? Uh, that is correct, but we never turned down an offer from a private citizen to fund something. <laughs> <as well. laughs> but my wife has given me dirty looks, so I really <laughs> I'm a little worried. <laughs> the uh, the funds obviously the city owns several buildings, maintains several. We have funds for things, maintenance, improvements, etc. We would take it out of existing funds that have already been approved in a budget. Can I go ahead and make a motion? I'd like to make a good discussion. Can I make a motion first? If you don't mind. Not at all. Okay, just so we can narrow the discussion. I, I would move to appoint uh, Sherry Marcus uh, to form a committee of whoever you, dis you want to put on it uh, and effectuate putting our national motto on the wall. And if the committee decides they want to raise private funds to to do that, you're, you're, you have the discretion to do so. Uh, is there a second? Mr. Mayor? Well, we're, we're going to dis discuss it. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, I just want to get it on the table. Okay, so we have a second. I'll second that. Okay, and uh, Bishop, do you, did you have something you wanted to say? If I could, sir. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I had vowed that I would not uh, do anything except listen. And well, before you go on, he, he gets to do that because he's the mayor emeritus. I appreciate that's, that. And that's why I didn't make him turn in a card. Okay, go ahead. I appreciate that. I, 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 I totally, 100% support having our national emblem on the back wall. I really totally do. And I, and I would certainly hope that everybody could understand that if you can't put that up there, we probably need to move the flag because they are one and the same as far as I'm concerned. And it has nothing to do with our religion. However, Henry Hearns, over 18 years, 
didn't have any problem with fighting with the ACLU or anybody else who wanted to move Reverend from my name for a long time. I did not back off of that. And I will never, ever back off of it. So I really would love to see that, and I will do anything I can to help raise funds if needed. Thank you so much. I second the motion. Too late. No, uh, oh, you did? It already seconded. <laughs> I'll third it. Very good. Any other discussion? You, you know, we talk about our national motto, and whether you believe in God or not, I think we should get, give deference to the history of our country and how it was founded. We all live under the umbrella of democracy and freedom. We should certainly pay at least lip service to what it took to make this country what it is and to keep it sound and solid. Absolutely. I agree. Are we ready to vote? It's unanimous. Okay. Do you have any announcements, Mr. Wobbezegian? Uh, yep. Yeah. Excuse me. Last week we had the opportunity to host a delegation from the Chinese consulate arranged by Supervisor Antonovich. And our economic development staff, Fern Lawson, he, he actually, um, Marta Golding Brown, led the charge and we were able to present to the governor's office the supervisor's office, both federal representatives and our state representatives, I believe a very compelling case why Lancaster was the place to invest. I know that we impressed um, the consulate very much uh, to the point where they're going to direct a, a couple of very good opportunities our way of Chinese companies that want to invest in the United States. Uh, Vice Mayor Smith represented the council at that meeting, and I'd like to ask Vice Mayor Smith if he'd like to say anything. You know, it was a very impressive meeting we had, like uh, Mr. Bizigan said, uh, representatives from all of the branches of our government uh, here in the Chinese delegation was very impressed. In fact, the governor's office was very impressed, and they said, uh, she, she told me, she said, we sh wish we could duplicate Lancaster and just put it all along California. Um, the staff has to be commended. They did an excellent job, and uh, I think that um, it put us on the map with a, a lot of large companies that might be looking at future economic development here in our city. You know, I can't emphasize how huge this is. I mean, this is huge. This could really solve a lot of our, our coming problems. Uh, it, it might be the, the basis of an industrial base that we desperately need. And that, that's incredible that you guys were able to do this. You know, my hat's off to Vice Mayor Smith and the staff. Okay. Uh, okay. City Clerk. This portion of the agenda allows the individ any, any, any individual to address the City Council on items that are not on the agenda. You may fill out a speaker card, which you'll find at the back of the Council Chambers. State law does prohibit the City Council from taking action on items that are not on the agenda. Your matter will be referred to the City Manager. Individual speakers are limited to three minutes each. When you come up to the podium, you'll see the three lights. The yellow light will come on when you have 30 seconds left, and the red light will come on when your time is up, as well as you will hear the chimes as well. Uh, we ask that you be considerate of the allotted time to allow other speakers to have their three minutes as well. And if needed, Council will address your concerns under Council comments. Thank you. Mr. Shabera. Mr. Mayor, members of the Council, first of all, Mr. Mayor, congratulations on your election and congratulations to your two new uh, colleagues also. I'm wearing two hats here as a mobile home resident of Sherwood Mobile Home Park on the east side and as the AV representative for the Coalition of Mobile Home Owners of California. I pray that the protective ordinances that the prior City Council and staff have passed here over the last two years with respect to mobile home protections and needs uh, will be maintained. I fear that they will be lost if Proposition 98 on the June 3rd ballot 
uh, passes. I understand that the League of California Cities, which you subscribe to, has uh, sponsored, along with others, Prop 99, which is a counter Prop 98. Whichever one wins by one vote will, will carry. Who knows if there will be major litigation after that. I thank you, Mr. Mayor, for, in, for distributing in your recent election a flyer that paid some attention to mobile homeowner needs. And if I may quickly read uh, your statement there. Mobile homeowners need protection from huge increases in space rent. As mayor, I will support strong rent stabilization in Lancaster for mobile home parks to provide the security they deserve. I hope you will join me in building a city that protects all its residents. Uh, that support statement for rent stabilization, Mr. Mayor, would be lost. Your entire ordinance dealing with rent stabilization and the board that's set up to enforce it would be lost if Prop 98 passes. In fact, the major thrust of Prop 98, other than eminent domain, is that it would eliminate rent control for mobile homes, destroy values of mobile homes, and threaten protections already passed on unfair evictions. The worry that you had about water earlier is also a major part of Prop 98 since it would deal with natural resources. I would hope that in the coming weeks and months, and I understand now from staff that at your next meeting, the ordinance prepared by staff here to protect the three remaining senior parks out of your 28 is coming up before you. However, there's another ordinance that we fear uh, it should be passed, and that's the one that deals with the prevention of condoization of our mobile home parks. If you really want disaster in our mobile home parks, if only one person buys his or her land, for whatever reason, all of us in the park lose rent control. And there went this rent stabilization that you so strongly espouse, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your great support, sir, and I'm sorry I took too much time. For your time. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, Ms. Goss. There are laws that prevent sexual predators from living within 2,000 feet of a school or lingering within 300 feet of places where children gather. But is there a law to prevent sexual predators from shopping in a super center or patronizing any of the other stores or fast food establishments that are associated with a super center? With recidivism rates as high as 43% for sex offenders, why tempt them? by building two large commercial centers across the streets from Quartz Hill High School in Kitty Corner to Joe Walker Junior High School, a location where students will gather and predators can loiter while shopping. Many students stay after school for practice, attend clubs, or sporting events, and at any time you may find students waiting on the corner for a ride home. <coughs> Everyone knows that these super centers, if built, will become a truancy haven. Predators can patronize the stores in the fast food establishments shopping for their next victim. We don't need a repeat of the 2002 kidnapping and assault of the two female Quartz Hill High School students that were abducted by gun from a teenage gathering place. Walmart welcomes overnight parking of motorhomes and trailers in their parking lot, but do they check to see if any of these overnighters are sexual predators just waiting to nab a child walking back or to school, or leaving a school activity. I very much doubt it. The concerns of parents and the safety of children should outweigh the concerns of the developers trying to make a buck. Let them make their buck without placing the children in harm's way. If the AV really needs a yet another two super centers, build them in another location away from the high school and the junior high school. Commercial and schools are not a good mix because criminals follow the money and predators the scent of prey. Place the safety of our children above the development and vote to not change the zoning of these two pieces of property to commercial. And again, I'm offering myself as a walking companion for you, but not at Lane Park, or excuse me, Lancaster City Park. I say you should be walking with the, with the uh, citizens 
in their neighborhood where their concerns are. And if you meet me at the corner of Avenue L and 60th Street West any school day morning, because it would be pointless to show up when school is not in session, you may see the traffic that is generated currently right now without adding more. Sit. Mr. Thank Mayor. You. And members of the council, I, I just, I, I've said this before a number of times uh, be, but to the prior council. Uh, both projects that she was talking about are uh, proceeding through various processes uh, for approval. They are not yet before you for consideration. There will be public hearings at which you will be called upon to take testimony as part of the record and to then consider that record in making your decision. So whatever comments are made outside of that process really should not be considered in terms of the approval of or disapproval of, of those projects. Thank you. That, and that does not mean that she does not have the right to come up here every meeting and talk about it, but I just want you to understand what, from a due process standpoint, that that will be coming back at a future meeting. Well, I can't wait for those hearings. <laughs> it should be a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Cunningham. James Cunningham. I think he okay. left, sir. Uh, David Paul had to leave. He's having surgery tomorrow, and he'll be hopefully back to next meeting. Uh, that concludes the non-agendized -agenda items. Is that right? And now I think we have Mr. Cilio. Thank you, Mayor Paris. Um, we've not had this in the past, and I thought it would be a good idea to start. We're all now duly appointed to various boards and committees, and. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea for us from time to time to report on the activities of, of the organizations we're now attached to. Um, so what I've chosen to do is, is after each attendance at each meeting of the uh, uh, County Sanitation District to submit to you a, a report um, really for your, your reading pleasure. And if there's anything of interest, I'll comment on it. I would like to see my fellow council members to do that as well so that we can all be apprised of, of uh, what's happening. The only thing of interest on the uh, um, the District 14 meeting last month was that uh, they are going to have a public hearing at the end of this month. I believe it's the 28th. I may or may not be correct there. Um, that's going to involve a potentially eminent domain of some of the property they're, they're trying to uh, uh, buy east of the city for um, uh, extension of the uh, uh, sewer maintenance plant, their, their 2020 plan. Um, and if you choose to go to that meeting, uh, it's moved up from its usual time to 11.30 in the morning, but I suspect I'll be the one there. So other than that, that's all I have on that, and uh, you'll be uh, getting these from me periodically. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I, that sanitation board is an important board, and I, what I don't want to do is disrupt the continuity of it. Uh, and in you're doing an excellent job on it, and I think it's an excellent idea that we report back whenever we, we go to any of these meetings. And so why don't we just informally agree to make that a policy, okay? Well, actually, when I saw that uh, Mr. Cilio was going to report on it, there was something that I was going to suggest a while back ago, which was what he said, and that's why you see here that we have a council report on it. And I think what we've worked out with the clerk and the city manager is that uh, if we have something in writing that we're going to report on, you'll actually see it as a CR1 item. If we don't, then each of us will still have the opportunity to report on the different committees uh, that we've sat on. So I'd like to report on the AVTA. Um, um, Councilwoman Marcus and I uh, went to it. And it was basically just a uh, introduction session, uh, informative. So there was really no action items. Um, so uh, that's all that to report on that one at this time. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, we're going to go into closed session now for the purpose of discussing a personnel matter, which is the we either hire them or we don't, of the city manager. <laughs> Okay, let's call the meeting back to order.
Mr. Mayor, would you like me to give the report of the Please. Situation? The uh, Council did meet in closed session under uh, Government Code Section 5495.7 um, for a personnel matter um, and um, determined to um, appoint uh, Mark Bozigian as the permanent city manager um, and to direct the attorney to uh, negotiate with him the terms of a uh, of an employment agreement which will be brought back at a future council meeting for um, approval. Thank you. Before I you're yours. I don't have to send you back. Can I? <laughs> oh, you got to go, don't you? Yeah, I need to. Okay. Thank you. You know what this means? It means I'm the lawyer now. <laughs> Mark, I want to thank you on behalf of the city for holding us together in a time of great tumultuous tearing apart. Most people could not have filled that breach as well as you did. Uh, you brought us back together, you kept us functioning, you avoided taking sides when, when it would have clearly have been to your benefit to take sides. You behaved with absolute honor and integrity and professional competence. And I am proud to know you. Uh, and with that, I would Oh, and Mr. and Mrs. Bozigian, you done good. <laughs> if I might, um, I'm really honored and, and humbled by the opportunity and the trust the council's placed to me. And, and I sincerely, and this is not words, this is, I sincerely believe this is a um, show of confidence in the entire staff that you have. The management team uh, here is first rate, as good as any in the in the in the state, and the staff. You know, people tend to think public employees don't work hard. I will put this staff up against any public or private in anywhere. This is the hardest working group of people I have ever been with, and the most creative. Um, I, I'm. I have a lot of things I'd like to say, but I'm really not feeling too good. I'm sick, so I'm going to kind of just kind of do a couple things. One. The reason I'm excited, this is a great city with great people, and um, it, it, it's harder to work here and to live here because you, you need to actually be more involved to make your community better, and that's what's great about this city is everyone here in this city, this council, even if you have your political differences, want to make this city better. So I'm really honored and, and excited about that. Uh, on a personal note, um, I, my family home for 18 years was within a mile of City Hall. Uh, my grade school, Sacred Heart, was within a mile of City Hall. My first two jobs, one of them with Mr. Mann as my boss, was uh, within a mile of City Hall, McDonald's and Baroni's. And um, I spent a lot of wayward evenings on Lancaster Boulevard. So um, I am, uh, you know, this is something to me that's very, very personal. And I'd like to acknowledge my wife, Karen, and my son, Sean, who are here. My daughter, Brenna, is uh, at a school function. And um, they put up with a lot, and they put up with me being cranky at home when I haven't had a good day at work, so I appreciate that. And I would in particular like to uh, acknowledge my mom and dad. Um, it's, uh, it's really easy to succeed when you have a daily model of what it means to live your life right and to have integrity and such. And uh, any accomplishments that I have been able to have are because of my parents. And I really thank my, Ralph, my dad, Ralph, and my mother. <laughs> Let's get started. Great. We're adjourned. Oh, wait a minute. i got to say till May 26th, May 27th at 6 p.m. <laughs>